Broadcasting from their world headquarters in Texas, it's the Arcade Repair Tips Live Show. The show that discusses arcade repair, restoration, news, and more. Now, here are your hosts, Tim and Jonathan. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 76 of the Arcade Repair Tips live show for June 2023. My name is Jonathan Leung. I'm the producer, director, and editor here at the Arcade Repair Tips video series. And joining me today, as always, is Mr. Arcade Repair Tips himself, Tim Peterson. Tim, how are you doing? I'm doing okay, John. You ever had one of those days where everything tried to go wrong, but it, it somehow worked out? And that's, uh, so far, that's why this, this day everything in the world is going backwards and... Not the way I planned it to go this morning when I got up, but I'm rolling with the punches, and we're going to make it work. There you go. Well, um, Tim, I know that you're you're having some travel things that are going on, especially with your, your wife's on a plane, correct? Yeah, she's, trying, she's uh, flying by herself for the first time, and she's trying to get home, and there's been a delay, so we had to make a few changes. So up front, I want to apologize. I am going to have to check my phone frequently, and if it rings, maybe the airline, I may have to take a call during the middle of the live show. But as you guys know, that's why it's live, right? Uh, Life doesn't stop just because uh, we're talking about arcade games. But we'll do the best we can and hope that you guys enjoy the show tonight. Speaking of the show, I have upped our quality, Tim. We are broadcasting in 1080p on this one. I did some testing uh, earlier last week, and it seemed like everything was working. And so I mentioned last last time that we got a new camera, but you really couldn't tell the difference because we were still broadcasting at 720p. I'm hoping with the 1080p switch, you may be able to tell the difference now. Hopefully the quality is better on your end, and hopefully our connection will hold up so that we can get through the show this evening. So uh, hopefully you guys that'll help you guys and give you a little bit better picture of what you're looking at here at the live show. So... Yeah. Before we get started, though, we do want to remind everybody that you can chime in during the show by using the live chat if you guys are watching this live. And Tim, we already have several people here in the live chat with I us tonight. Uh, we got uh, Geek Light 08. He says, greetings all. We have uh, Real Hammer Billy Lee says, hello, hello. Current Phonograph says, uh, greetings from June Gloom, California, Tim. Wow. Then we have uh, Nate Berg from Nova Scotia, Halifax. Okay. Then we've got Paul Jure is here. Big D Retro is here. Robbie J is here. Uh, let's see, BLR is here from Minnesota, Tim. Okay. And then we have Encore's Arcade here as well. We are so glad to have you guys all with us. Tim, um, it's kind of hard. I feel like it's harder to get everything in sync when we when we broadcast on the first of the month. Is that just me? Maybe. I it, don't know. It seems it, like things get a little bit tighter, and it's just, I don't know if it has something to do with just the way things line up. The first is always a busy mm-hmm. time, it seems like. And Maybe. so we are glad you are here, though, and we're glad that you made time on your June 1st to join us for the show tonight. Now, we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff tonight. A uh, couple of teasers. Tim actually put together his arcade one up NFL Blitz game that he got for Finally. Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> we actually helped him with that. So we'll be talking about that later in the show if you want to get our thoughts on the uh, arcade one up NFL Blitz game. Uh, but outside of that, Tim and all the busyness with the travel, how are you doing just in general? Everything's good. Um, just seems like uh, we talk about it all the time. Just when you think things are going to slow down, they ramp back up. It just seems to never slow down. Uh, but did uh, have a good trip to Amarillo. Looking forward to going to South Dakota for the first time uh, this coming week. So if you're in the Sioux Falls area, I will be there all week next week, first uh, full week of June. Uh, doesn't seem like it should be June. I know. I mean, it's like that's halfway through 2023. Pretty close to it, yeah. And it's just like we just got here. Yep. Right? I don't know. So it just seems like this year is really flying by. Um, but you know, how, how about you? Everything going okay with you guys? Everything's good. Obviously I told, told you that we hung out over the Memorial Day weekend a little bit, so we'll talk mm-hmm. about that later. But you mentioned Amarillo, Tim, and we have a real great thing to show you. You visited another arcade bar, right? I did. I visited, uh, a, a really cool place to go if you're in that area. Uh, a lot of things to do in Amarillo. Amarillo's a pretty unique and, uh, neat town. Uh, I'll even tell you about, uh, uh, I did not eat the 72 ounce steak. We just we should throw that out in advance. Oh, yeah. So there's no film <laughs> footage of that. Um, I barely made it through a piece of gum in the last episode, so <laughs> you know, n- n- definitely couldn't eat that big Texan. But um, if you're ever in that area, the Amarillo is a very unique place to visit, and they got a really cool arcade bar. We're going to show you some video or uh, pictures of. Sorry, there, there long go. day. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we also have an update on the gigantic Donkey Kong at the Strong Museum of Play. Yeah. From uh, one of our viewers, Martin. So I hope you guys will stay tuned for that. But Tim, we know why everybody's here, right? That's right. Everybody's here because we answer questions about arcade repair. And so that's what we'll be doing this evening. Now, Tim, before I get into that real quick, B Big Daddy Bradley is here from Central Illinois, Tim. Okay. And then John is here from, from a Chicago suburb. How neat. I so like when you guys put where you're from. It's so neat to hear... Uh, where everybody's chiming in from all over the all over the planet some days uh, definitely we've got a good widespread across the u.s tonight so thank you for being here you're really important and we're glad that you're here and by all means if y'all have a question in the chat room please chime in comments are always welcome as, to, as are always welcome as well tim so uh with that said let us go ahead and move into our questions for this episode and the first one we have here tim is from jim so let me put that up on the screen for everybody here jim says hello i recently purchased a 19 and 1 pcb and wiring harness for my stand-up cabinet i am an automotive technician so i am fairly familiar with electrical but far from an electrician Everything seemed to power up. After about 45 to 60 seconds, the music turns on and I get a scrambled screen. You seem to be the people to ask. This is my first arcade rebuild, so sorry if my terminology is minuscule. I have, pi I have pics of the screen issue. It switches like the game cycling through a menu, harness, and the monitor backing. Thank you in advance, and I look forward to hearing from you, Jim. So, Tim, Jim mentioned that he did... Send us some pictures, so I want to okay. go ahead and throw these up for you. So the first picture that we have here is, of course, of Jim's scrambled screen, it looks like, uh -huh. in the cabinet itself. The second picture we have here is of the chassis. Now, Tim, just looking at that chassis there, could you tell us what chassis that is? And maybe I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but I think you should be Is that a G07? Um, I don't think it's well, a G07. Uh, wait a second. The Wells Gardner... Could show it again. Okay. I didn't, I, okay, I'll put it back up. I've here got right my now. glasses on, but not <laughs> really good. Okay, here okay, we go. Okay, that monitor right there, it's a Wells Gardner, probably a 4900. Right, it doesn't have the cards. Right. So that'd be the big giveaway for the 46. So yes, this looks like a Wells Gardner 4900 to me. And then Tim, he did take a picture of his mm. harness, which one thing we do appreciate, guys, is that he did get the Holland Computers harness, Tim. The one that we recommend. Right. And the reason we recommend it is exactly for this reason right here. You will notice, let's point out a couple of things here, that the wires are thicker on the power on the power pins than they are on the rest of it. Plus, the whole thing is labeled in what, Tim? Well, it's labeled in English. In English! <laughs> oh my goodness, what, 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 <laughs> it's mind-blowing! Because how many of you guys have seen Chinese Chinese writing on your JAMA harness? Right. I mean, golly, it seems like every other one has it. But no, the Hong Computers one is always printed in English, which is very helpful, and has the thicker wires for the power. So, Tim, we know he's using a good harness. Uh, we know that he's got a Wells Gardner 4900, and Tim, Paul confirmed what you said. Okay. <laughs> and so with all that said, Tim, what do you think is going on with Jim's uh, 19 and one build here? Well, it definitely looks like it's out of sync. Sure. You know, and, um, and I know, and I appreciate his honesty. You know, it's like, I may not know the terminology and stuff. We didn't know. And a lot of times when we first started repairing games, they would say it's out of sync. I didn't really understand what that meant either, except for I was, of uh, those of us who grew up in the 80s and, and probably even your very youngest years, John, where the TV, we would have to mess with the antennas. And it just, that's what it was. It wasn't in sync. And all of a sudden, my dad would, you know, I was the remote. And uh, my dad would tell me to hold it. And then I'd get it just right. And we we're watching a football game. He's like, now stay right there. Yep. And I couldn't move or the game wouldn't work. I mean, or the TV wouldn't work. So that's kind of the way this is. It's like it's out of sync. It's like it can't tell uh, whether to go uh, left or right and something. So in order to, um, you just need, he might just need to adjust it. And hopefully that will bring the sync back in. Uh, now, if it's will not sync up and it's having issues, then we're going to have to send it to our friend Paul or somebody that works on them. Uh, probably some uh, the Q301. There's some capacitors that could be, or maybe even an IC chip that won't just won't allow it to sync up. But he may need to do some work. But hopefully, we're going to try to. First thing we're always going to do is check the wiring to um, that, and make sure that it's wired up correctly, that the composite and the negative aren't backwards or something. We've seen a lot of games like that before, especially we don't know the history of this. But a lot of times if you take it from one game and put it, even though it's a work of modern, you put it in another game, they require a different sync. And so maybe that could be the issue that it just needs to be wired correctly also. 
So those are a couple things that I would definitely check into. Okay, Tim. So basically what you said is what I put on the slide uh, with a little bit more detail, of course. So let's okay. go ahead and look at that here. Uh, so it does look like he has a K4900, Tim, just looking at it. So and it does look like it's out of sync, like Tim mentioned. Let's start off by checking the monitor input wiring, specifically the sync wire. Now, Tim, the reason I mentioned this was because he's, it almost sounds like he was wiring this from scratch a little bit. And so he needs to keep in mind that Jamma boards typically output composite negative sync. Okay, that's like if you have a Jamma board in your game, more than likely it's composite negative sync that's coming out of that. So in order to hook that up to this chassis, you will need to connect that sync wire to the last pin, okay, which is labeled negative H sync on the separate three pin connector at location P201. Okay, if you do not have that sync wire there, you will be out of sync. Okay, so okay. And obviously there's a lot of places you can put it. Some people will split We'll split that sink and put it in in uh, in like both the horizontals. That's not a good way to do it. You really just need to put it on that negative H sink line and none of the rest of them. So do not combine sinks on this, right? Or no. separate sinks, excuse me. So now it is possible you have a monitor chassis issue. So um, you know, just Tim, if we look at the flow chart, we can see the transistor Q301, capacitor uh, C215, and IC301 play a part in that sync circuit. So let's make sure all of those are working properly. And of course, replace the parts if they are malfunctioning. And Tim, we said, Paul said it could be a bad PCB or low five volts as well. So you could have a low voltage issue as well. So Jim, those are for other sure. things to look into. Tim, do you have anything else for Jim before you No, Paul's on? exactly right. We, we say this all the time, do the ASAP approach, always start at power. Uh, so you wanna make sure that the voltage is dialed in really good. Mm -hmm so that you will get a proper, uh, it's able to sync like it's supposed to. There you go. So Jim, hopefully answers your question. If you have any additional comments that you wanna make or you wanna, you have additional questions you may wanna ask, please email us back and let us know and we'll be happy to help you out further. Again, let's check that sync wiring. Let's make sure um, that that is good first and check our five volts and make sure that we're getting good five volts to the board as well. Probably the best place to start there. Okay, Tim. Um, Paul also said if sync hasn't been adjusted, then of course adjust that as well. For sure. Uh, so let me go over to the live chat before we move on to the next question. We have the regular show here. He says, hello, that was a track and field and I'm restoring a track and field right now. That is a track and field cabinet, Tim, sure. that uh, Jim is working on. So that is correct. Big Daddy Bradley says, I can still hear the ka-chunk sound when changing the channels, right? <laughs> like uh -huh. on the old one, right? right? The old dial, oh, gosh, dial yeah. TVs. Um, let's see... Uh, John says check power first and guys like Tim mentioned ASAP is a big thing that we preach around here always start at power make sure that you have good power going to your board because if you don't it will cause a world of other trouble for you so make sure that that five volts is dialed in Jim getting to your game board that's very important use a multimeter if you can so okay is that it I think is we're it? caught up Tim okay so let us move on to our next question from Joel so here we go Joel writes hi I just recently bought a Cosmic Adventure cabinet and I'm trying to install a coin up button to the coin switch, but I can't get it to work. It has three wires, a black, a gray, and a red, and I've tried all the combos to no avail. What am I missing? So Tim, uh, Joel just wants to add in what we would call a free play button, right? Right. To his Cosmic Avenger. Now, Cosmic Avenger is an early 80s game, Tim. Probably, I think 1981. So one of the earlier um, 80s games. And so with that in mind here, Tim, um, he's got these three wire colors. So which one does he need to hook up in order to get his, his uh, coin switch to start uh, adding coins to the game? Well, this is a really good example of... Um, we're going to first start and say never trust a wire color. Um, you always want to track back to where are the two switches that are going to the wire. One will be a ground and one will be the coin switch itself. You got to try to track that back to your harness and see where those two wires come out. Those are the two that you need. You can't go by wire colors. Uh, just like uh, yellow might normally be 12 volts, but not always. So uh, a lot of times we've done this ourselves. We repaired a game. Uh, before and we didn't have a green wire so we wired up a brown one or whatever so the wire color doesn't matter it's where does it go to the board so what you need to do is find the pinouts and find out which two wire one will be in a common and the other one being uh, coin one or coin two and wire those two them two wires to his switch and that will allow him to coin up yeah, for all we know, Tim, he could be he could be hooking up like the the coin meter or something right. like that. That's Go. what it sounds like when he said red and black. I thought he's the, that sounds more like voltage. Normally, a red wire would be a voltage wire, sure, but not necessarily. 
probably wiring up the coin meter, which could really do some damage to his board if it goes and sends it the wrong direction. Sure. So Tim, I'm going to go ahead and throw this information up here because basically what I came to was the same conclusion you came to. Mm -hmm. So we'll go ahead and show that on the screen. Unfortunately, we can't really go by just the, the colors and tell you which two wires connect to your coin switches. The best thing to do is to identify the coin switch wires on the harness that connect to the game board, trace them down to where they go in the cabinet, and then connect them to your coin switch at that point. This will ensure you're using the correct wires. Now, Tim, there is something to be careful of. It is important to note the Cosmic Avenger has different pinouts depending on whether you have an up upright or a cocktail cabinet. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, and you can find both pinout sets in the manual. And so, Tim, I have a link to the manual here, and I also have a link down below, so he can just click that link and go. So in the show description, we have a link for that as well. And, Tim, what I have here is the wiring schematic over... I think, th I think this is for the... Um, it's for both versions, so I think the top may be it's hard to see in this little thing which is why you need to go to the manual but the uh -huh. top may be the stand up the bombs the the um sit down but or vice versa can't really tell but in this case they are different pinouts so you will need to make sure you use the right pinouts for whatever whatever type of cabinet you have because that is how you're going to determine where those coin switch wires are Tim, is there anything else for Joel before we move on? No, I don't think so. Okay, so Joel, hopefully answers your question. Again, let's not go by the wire color. Let's see if we can track down those wires from the harness, then trace them all the way through your cabinet, find where they're going, and then hook up your switch, the switch that you want to use to coin up your game there instead. So, And like Tim mentioned, all you'll need is a ground, any of the coin one or coin two uh, switch wire or, or pin wire in order to hook it up, and you should be in good shape. So. Yeah, sounds like he kind of knows what to do. He's just a little confused with the wire colors and stuff. Don't let, don't ever just go by wire colors um, unless you just got a brand new harness or something. Even then, we still check them because yes. it would be real easy for somebody to mislabel one or for a wire to get in the wrong place. Or So just be careful. We don't always want to go by the color. We want to go by where it actually connects to the connector. Exactly. So... Okay, Tim, I'm looking at the live chat. It looks like Delusional has joined us. Hey, how's it going, Delusional? Glad to have you here. And uh, just, man, just a lot of activity. We're so glad you guys are all here tonight. It is mm -hmm. so awesome to have you all all here. Um, for those of you guys who missed some of our teasers earlier, we're going to have an arcade bar update from Tim's Travels from one that he visited in Amarillo, Texas. We're also going to have an update on the Strong Museum of Play and their gigantic Donkey Kong that they're working on. We have some uh, information to share with you that I think is going to be really interesting to, the, to our fans out there. Uh, so we're really looking forward. We hope you guys stay tuned for all of that great stuff coming soon. So, uh, Tim, let us continue on with questions, though. Okay. And this next one is from AJ. So here we go. AJ writes, Hello, I watched your video on arcade dip switches, and it was great. It was a great video to watch because you were using a centipede arcade board, and that is what I have. It is set to free play, and I am trying to get it to coin play. Can you give me the instructions to change it to one coin, one credit, and one credit to play? Also, I picked up a Sega Daytona USA 2 and have been told it need, I need a new amplifier and drive board. Do you have any of those items or know, know where I can get them? I have been told I can get a drive board from another one of the Sega games that use the same board, just just install a different EEPROM. I would like to get your opinion on that. Thank you for all your help. Thank you, AJ. So we got a double thank you there. Okay. So okay. I like double thank yous. I'll take as many thank yous as I can get, Tim, for sure. So... With that said, Tim, we have AJ here, and he's got two questions, really. The first question is he's got a centipede board, which we show in our video on changing dip switches because it's a really nice board. It's got it's very easy to see where the dip switches are. And it's on free play now, but he wants to change that to one coin, one credit. So in order for okay. him to do that, what does he need to do? Well, like he said, we he's seen our video. Yep. So he knows where the dip switch settings are. Correct. Um, main thing is to make sure your power is off. You don't want to ever change a dip switch setting with the game on. So we want to power it off, and you're going to put one to the on position, and then two in the off position. And that should make it to where it's one coin, one play, based on um, what the manual says. I now, would highly recommend... Go ahead. I was going to say, now there are three banks of dip switches on this. Which bank of dip switches does he need to change the, If I remember, it's the far right. It's uh, N8. So N8. In, and I know you got a picture of it coming up, John. So it's one way... Closest to the edge, I guess. Okay. And then, uh, so once he sets that, he should be able to do it. The good thing is, if for any reason he's on the wrong dip switch, it just won't work. Go. What I would do, especially if I was a newbie, take a picture, change one thing, and then if it doesn't work, you'll know in, you had the wrong dip switch. Put that one back to where it was, 
and try the other one. But it should be, if you'll look at this picture that you're fixing to show, I think it will really help him. Now, Tim, uh, let's go to the second question real quick. We got the Daytona USA 2. Now, he's looking for parts. We do not sell parts here, and we, right. we've said that before. But where can AJ possibly get these parts for this Daytona USA 2? He can try Play It Amusements and see if they can help. The EEPROM swap, you can probably, um, should work if you can find a comparable board. Uh, probably the best place to pr try these days would be eBay or something like that. Or a local distributor, somebody might have some of those. Just post those on some of the uh, groups and things. Even post it on our page if what you're looking for, somebody may have that. It's not that uncommon a board. Sounds good. So, Tim, I'm going to go ahead and throw this up here so we can kind of uh, summarize what you went over here. So, um, in order to change your centipede to free, from free play to coin play, first locate the 8-dip switch bank at location in eight like tim mentioned now tim you said the one to the closest far side of the board it's really kind of in the middle if you're looking at the board and it is an eight dip bank which is something that's very important but in eight is what you're looking for that's the location where that dip switch bank is once you have done that you'll need to make sure like tim said the dip switch one is in the on position and dip switch two is in the off position if the game is on free play now both of those switches are probably in the on position right tim yeah it's the one the one on the right you did a good job of circling it there john yeah. so it made so it easy the harness connector is going to be if you're looking at this picture i didn't really show up it's going to be on the far left of yes. this so where the actual harness connector is and so it's kind of if you go all the way the right it's the furthest bank on the right from the harness connector correct so or furthest from the harness connector may be a good way to say it yes now unfortunately we do not sell any parts and we're not sure exactly where you can locate an amplifier and driver board you need but Plate Amusements is the Sega Parts place to get things, right, Tim? Correct. And so you can try Plate Amusements. I have a link down below in the show description so you can contact them, and they may have some. Now, if you can find a compatible drive board, yes, you should be able to do the EEPROM swap, but you're going to have to find a compatible drive board. So that may be that may be tough as well. So um, you don't necessarily have to find a Daytona USA 2 one. Uh, there are a couple of other games, driving games specifically, that use that system. And I forget what system that's a Model 3 or something like that. But um, there are a couple of other arcade driving games that use that system. And if you can find one that has basically a comparable board, yes, you should be able to do the EEPROM swap on it. But it may be just as hard to find one of those as it is to find the board you're looking for. So Correct. something to keep in mind. Like Tim mentioned, try some of the groups, arcade groups, eBay, uh, some places like that, and you should be able to find them. Tim, I found a, a picture of the setup here so he could kind of see it. You know, he, I'm sure Easy. he knows what it looks mm -hmm. like. But uh, another thing about Play It is they do some repairs on these kind of things too, right, Tim? Right. You could send it in and ask them about it, or they may have a, a board. So Play Amusements would definitely be our first stop just because they are the authorized Sega parts distributor here in the United States. And so if you're here, that would definitely be the first place we would try. But you may also try eBay, um, several of the arcade groups, um, obviously the R um, KLOV. Tim is important, so the KLOV group pages and things like that. So, um, but some of the arcade forums around, you may be able to find somebody who has one. Uh, you know, it's just it's kind of a it's kind of a um, hide and seek kind of thing. Needle in a haystack, hopefully not. Right. But you know, it's it may be tough to come by for sure. So just keep trying, keep posting some of the arcade groups. Hopefully, somebody will be able to hook you up. Tim, anything else for AJ before we move on? I don't think so. Sounds good. So AJ, hopefully that answers your question. Good luck getting your centipede into coin play and finding a driver drive and amplifier board for your Daytona USA 2 cabinet. Uh, Tim, we have current, current phonograph here, and he says, does anyone have any experience with games, Game Room Solutions in regards to arcade cabinet kits? Uh, Tim, I can't say that I have. Have you ever ordered from Game Room Solutions? No, I don't know. Okay, so maybe somebody in the live chat has ordered from them before. Um, we have not, so we don't have that much uh, that much experience with them. Couldn't tell you um, about their arcade cabinet kits or if they're good or not. But hopefully somebody in the live chat can chime in here. Or if you're watching this after the fact, maybe you want to leave something in the comments here for current Frontograph. Let him know your opinion of Game Room Solutions. We'd love to hear that as well. Uh, Tim, we're always looking for good distributors and, and uh, part sellers and things like that because it's so hard to find reliable people. All the people on our resources page are all people that we have ordered from before Correct. and they're all people that we trust but you know we haven't ordered from everybody out there and so right. sometimes you know we have to get uh, these things second or third hand from some of you guys who have so you know if you have a good experience with game room solutions please let us know we'd love to hear your experience so uh, let's see big daddy bradley how about parts for neo geo cabinets i recently acquired a four slot mvs fuse holder is a problem so you may be able to get another fuse holder from uh, arcade parts and repair which is one of our one of our favorite uh, distributors for arcade parts you might try them uh tim man i <laughs> remember when uh Mark, our community manager, was stationed in oh, Korea gosh. at one point and went to a place that literally had Neo Geo boards and cards stacked to the ceiling. 
Yeah. And if you haven't seen Thousands. that, if you haven't seen that video, it's exclusive to our Volume Four DVD. But how long is that? It's like a forty-five minute video where he goes to this distributor in Korea and literally shows like just Neo Geo boards stacked up to the ceiling and things, and all for freaking cheap. He bought them for for you know I wouldn't say pennies on the dollar, Tim, but you know close. pretty good discount. And so mm-hmm. uh, you know somebody uh, some of those distributors though who sell those kind of parts may be uh, may be able to get you that as well. But like for just a general fuse holder, you should be able to get one probably from Arcade Parts and Repair or maybe some. Of the other distributors, our part distributors on our resources page, arcaderepairtips.com slash resources for that. Uh, Rigzer Show says, I have a GRS three three quarter scale. It's pretty good. I like it, um, but I chose my own joysticks button. So that's for the Gamer Solutions guys. Uh-huh. And so, um, you know, the three quarter scale cabinets that they sell are pretty cool, Tim. Uh-huh. I've heard, you know, and I've heard good things about that. They do sell controls as well. It seems like those controls are in pretty good quality for the most part. Again, we have no experience with them directly, so we haven't ordered from them. But we, I mean, most of the stuff that's out there seems pretty good. So, pretty much. Pretty we, good. There you go. Hardly ever hear of just somebody that's cheap or not doing very good quality these days. Exactly. So, Okay, now this next question is from Greg, and that's the Regzer show here, Tim. Right. And hopefully, Greg, I didn't get a response back from you when we talked about this, but I did want to talk about this just because I think you wouldn't be the only one if you did get hung up on this. You're definitely not the only one who's gotten hung up on this before. For sure. For sure. So let's go ahead and throw this up here real quick. So Greg wrote us and said, I just got my centipede fully working and need to turn the volume down, but I can't find the pot to adjust. I was looking around. I was wondering what this switch is for. It's not moving. I thought it was a test switch, but I already found the test switch on the coin door. Unfortunately, I can't press it, pull it, or move it. Maybe it's stuck. Thanks for any help, Greg. So, Tim, I actually put this on here because you can actually see, if you're looking at it, what does it look like to you? It looks like a potentiometer. Correct. So this does look like a potentiometer. Now, with that said, Greg didn't get back to me, so I don't know if you were able to turn this, because sometimes a potentiometer will seize, right, Tim? Yes. And it will stop working. And so it could be that you were trying to turn this potentiometer, and it seized on you and is no longer working. But, Tim, this would normally be what we would consider to be the volume potentiometer, correct? Yes. That's what exactly what it looks like. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So um, with that, I'm just going to put this in here. From your picture, it looks like the switch that you're trying to push, pull, or move, which Mm -hmm. is where our title for our episode came tonight, (laughs) might be the volume potentiometer slash rheostat, Tim, so that you're looking for. While many arcade boards have volume potentiometers located on the board itself, Street Fighter 2 is a great example of that, and got others, some boards do not. In order to control the volume on these cabinets, manufacturers would install a volume potentiometer slash rheostat such as this and typically mounted inside the coin door. So, of course, this is also a great way to add a volume control to an arcade cabinet that does not currently have one installed. And, Tim, we always recommend Holland Computers, uh, one of our favorite part distributors. They do sell a rheostat kit that is very handy if you do have an arcade game where you do not have a volume control. They even show you how to wire it, which is right. very handy. And you can see the link right there for the rheostat. Um, if you just follow that, that's also down below, Tim, so you can click on it. But if you have an arcade game where you don't have a volume knob there, then you can order that kit from Holland Computers, wire mm-hmm. it up, and now you have control of your volume. Volume. So, uh, Rick Show says, yes, it worked by spinning it. It was a little rusty, hard to turn. It did turn and volume adjusted problem solved. So there you go. We're glad to hear it. Here's the thing. You're not the only one that's done that. That's tried no. to push, pull, or, or, or try to adjust it and did not realize it turned. It, but we wanted to kind of put that out there, Tim, because there's a lot of people, I think, who have had this problem and don't realize that that is a potentiometer it is not a it's not a switch that you push or or pull or do anything else with it is an actual potentiometer a lot of times it'll have a a knob on the end and that makes sense you see the knob and you turn it Uh, a lot of a lot of times though in arcade games they just didn't just has the stem sticking out yes in fact guys if you're if you grew up in the 70s and 80s and during that time you might remember when your uh, radio actually had a volume knob on it. If you pull it off, that's what it would look like under the big stem sticking out at you. So uh, I've done the same thing. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend uh, spraying a lot of stuff in them, but on that around them a little bit, like some WD-40 or something. But I've had to take a pair of pliers, needle nose, or some locking pliers and actually kind of get it going. And then it actually works. So I don't know if they just get corroded or what goes on with them, but they do tend to get stuck. And sometimes it really takes some muscle to get them going, or you just got to replace them because they're kind of froze or locked up like that. Absolutely. Music from the wet and humidity and stuff, and it, they just over time, they kind of they go bad. 
Yes, that's exactly correct, Tim. And I have a receiver in my closet from the early 2000s that you can still pull the knob off and see the poten potentiometer little stick po uh, poking out. So mm -hmm. uh, even now it, with receivers, you can still see those a lot of times if they have a physical turning knob for either um, tuning or for volume or anything like that. And, and so Jonathan, you're correct. That little short clip that they do uh, is very good. It explains it really well. But if you like our style and you want to go, when we built that cocktail cabinet, we go into a little detail about wiring that up too. So you could kind of forward to that part where we wire up the volume knob and we take a little more bit more time explaining it might help also. Yes, yeah, so in our video on building the Holland Computers cocktail cabinet is what Tim's talking about. We do wire up that exact same uh, rheostat, Tim, in, right. order for, in order to hook up the volume for the 16-1 board that's inside of that cabinet. And so you can you, you can use that video and it will show you how to hook it up as well. It's very simple, it's not very hard at all. And like I said, it already comes pre-wired. So basically it's just you hook the volume up to here, you hook the speaker up to here and you're good to go. Yeah, it's so. real simple. And another thing is anytime we make a 60 and one game now, we just about always put a volume knob in them because everybody knows that thing is either blaring at you about to drive you crazy or it's way too low. It's, and you don't want to have to go into the settings every time. It's so much easier just to let it be on a high volume setting and then just crank it down with a knob or a potentiometer, uh, rheostat in that case. And it just makes it so much convenient because sometimes you need a little more volume, sometimes you don't. All you have to do is turn it instead of going into the settings. And it's kind of tricky to do anyway with their, their setup. I never have liked it. Yeah, I think um, volume control on the 61 board is one of the last screens you get to. So you literally yeah. have to go through the settings for like 60 games before you get to the volume control, exactly. which is a big pain. And Tim, I don't know about you, sometimes I like to crank my 80s music when I'm playing my arcade games and I want to make sure I can hear the game over my 80s music. For you know sure. what I'm saying? And so it's really handy to have that volume knob right there easily accessible. So, uh, Greg, we're glad that you figured it out and uh, good luck with the rest of your projects for sure. And split, especially that track and field project. I've been watching some of your posts on that. So Very good. Uh, Tim, with that said, we're going to come over here and um, go to some questions. We have quite okay. a few here. Uh, YouTube Punk is here. Hello. So we should say that. Now, John asks, any tips on making a custom wiring harness? I'm looking to making a few identical ones. So this is pretty simple. You don't need a whole lot. You just need the little um, whatever, how many pins you need for the harness. You just need the empty harness part of that. And then you just have to basically hook up a pin, hook up a pin to a wire, insert into the harness. Hook well, up a pin to the wire, insert into the Just harness. make sure that you're using the proper gauge wire. Agreed. That it's not something too thick or too thin. Whatever you're comfortable with. Um, you know, maybe a... 14, 16 gauge, you don't need something super thick, but I wouldn't use like 22 or nothing, it's too thin. Well, I will say that a lot of harnesses do use 22 on the controls, but then they'll use like an 18 or a 14 on, on, the, the, on power. the power wires, which I think that's okay if you want to go that route. But Tim's right, you don't you don't want to go too thin because um, you, just, you just risk maybe having um, breaks in your wire shorts and stuff like that, especially over time. Yeah, so also I would recommend that if you're going to put the connectors on, I like to strip my wire really good and I like to add a little bit of solder and then put some heat shrink over that where that makes a really good connection. You can just crimp them on there, but I don't. I usually like to tin mine with a little bit of solder just so I know they're really making a good connection and then heat shrinking over the top of that so that we don't have to worry about it cracking and breaking, uh, stuff like that. Um, but most of the time, that's a lot of work. <laughs> I just, I, it, I like the Holland computer one so much now, I probably would never do it again. Well, it depends. Um, but if it you're depends. making, yeah, for custom. Say, yeah, if you're making something custom that's not JAMA, right. then obviously you've got you to got do, to. Yeah, you got to make a harness. So, I mean, that's what it comes down to. But I think you gave him some good tips, John. Hopefully those are some good tips you can follow in your harness building. So, let's see what else here. Um, YouTube Punk says Dell had an awesome arcade tour last night. So, make sure you, get, sure you guys go to Delusional's channel and check it out. Okay. He's got good videos there. Seriously. Uh, let's see. Big D Retro. It's five amps the rule of thumb for power supplies in all arcades. I have an original Robotron, and I want to double check um, power supply before I power it up. Thanks. You know, Tim, it seems like 15 is more the standard. Yeah, he's saying amps. Did you mean volts? Yeah, not maybe amps. volts. I was about to say, I've seen more 15 amp uh, switching power supplies. It's yeah. probably like the... Five is pretty low. Right. And then in um, games like uh, newer style games, typically you'll see a 20, 25, maybe 30. It's up to 50 amp. 
just right. depending on the game. And like some driving games may have a higher amperage on that. And so, um, but 15 amps seems to be the common. Now, if you're talking about voltage, yes, 5 volts is pretty much common across the board. 5 and 12 is what most games need. Tim, if you're talking about the 60 and 1, you just need the 5. You right. don't even need the 12 hooked up. So, I mean, it just depends on what your board needs. Um, a lot of games may need negative 5 as well. So, you you know, if you're looking at voltage, you, you know, just make sure if your game requires negative 5 that you hook that up. But when it comes to amperage, like, I mean, you could go with smaller, but 15 is a pretty good standard just because it covers a wide variety of games. So I don't and, think I would go less than 15. Yeah, I mean, 5 may be enough to power it, to be honest with you. I mean, it, it, but, you know, like Tim said, why would you go any less? Right. You could always go more. Right. And, um, like, the switching power supply is pretty much our default at 15 amp. So I agree. Let's see what else we have here. Steven's here. He said, what did I miss? You missed nothing. You're here right on time. Isn't that always what we say? That's it. You're here right on time. The next question is going to be something you needed. Exactly. Know? Correct. Um, YouTube Punk, uh, Retro Ralph and Arcade Hollywood did tours of a new arcade in Georgia. Over 600 games, and that's called Pastimes Arcade. That is amazing. Wow. You guys check out those channels for that. So, um, obviously, Tim, we love it when arcades open. 600 games. Could that's you imagine crazy. the amount of maintenance and work those games <laughs> need? <laughs> yeah, pretty busy So, tech good luck to the store. techs there. We hope that you guys, um, you know, hopefully you have a whole team that's uh, ready to go at those. Because it is no small feat to keep games working, especially that many. Tim, you know, in our largest arcade, we had about 30 games. Right. And it took two of us just to keep them running all the time. Right. And so, and that's at two to 30. If you do that, you multiply that out, Tim, you end up with, you know, quite a few. Um, how many would that mm -hmm. be? That'd be like uh, quite a few. What, yeah. 40? 40 techs, something like that? Something like that, at so, least. Yeah. So... If you go there and all those games are working, you need to tip the text. Uh, there we go. We <laughs> talked about tipping text last <laughs> right. time. Yes. In that case, I would say tip the text. Especially if all of them are working. That's amazing. Absolutely. Uh, Nate's up. Curious with the question above, while the multimeter and, and the chips on the board... Uh, should it re should it read 5.05? .05? I think um, I think he's talking about maybe the amperage or the volts that we were talking about. So 5.05 .05 is fine uh, to run your voltage at. So mm -hmm. for most games, 5.05 .05 will work perfectly. Um, we tend not to go any higher than 5.1, and even 5.1 is pushing it. Do you really want to kind of be between that 5 and 5.1 range a lot of times? Running it a little high is not bad, but we, we tend not to go higher than 5.1 unless it's a game that has very high demanding power um you know like something like uh, golden tea driving games uh newer style computer based games those kind of things running it a little bit high is okay because typically um there's a lot of voltage drop within the game itself but um typically we want to be between that five and that 5.1 i hardly time. ever dial in right at five though 5.05 yeah. is kind of like my sweet spot if sure. i can find 5.05 i'm usually really good there i agree so let's see what else we have. Current photograph, do colors slash regions matter on CP System 2, i.e. works with Asia, Japan, etc.? Um, for the most part, it doesn't. So, I mean, except for the fact that they're only licensed, supposedly, for the country that they're, that they're you know, licensed for. So, mm -hmm. obviously, if it's a Japanese board, it's only supposed to be played in Japan. If it's a U.S. board, it's only going to be played in the U.S. But, I mean, if you've got it for home use, it really doesn't matter that much. Even if you have it in an arcade nowadays, I don't know if we're really enforcing region, you know, region locking kind of stuff. So, I don't think it'd be that big it'd an be issue. It'd be a stretch. I yeah, don't Yeah, exactly. Think I mean, I don't think anybody's going to bust you because you're running the Japanese version of a CPS2 game in an arcade. Um, so, but for the most part, they're pretty much the same game. There are differences sometimes, small differences between like the Japanese version and the American version and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, but for the most part, they are the same game. There's not a whole lot of difference. And so, I mean, you know, um, it really doesn't matter. Yeah, if same, that's bat what same batteries fail on both of them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Um, Steven, let's, or, uh, let's see, YouTube Punk. Um, the barcodes on games, so, uh, let's see, they barcode on the games, so if one has an issue, you can scan the barcode and report it. I didn't, yeah, I did not know that. I've always noticed that barcode, Tim, but I mm -hmm. did not realize that was the case on the CPS2. So, um, and Delusional says 5.0 is the sweet, uh, is the sweet spot, but he says 5.06 is his. So, okay. 5.06 mm -hmm. is the sweet, sweet spot. Okay. So, yeah, I mean. Very rarely are we going to dial in right at five because we are expecting at least a little bit of. I'm expecting drop. a tiny bit of drop. Yeah, yeah exactly. no matter what. So, let's see. John says five volts at the furthest spot on the board. Right, that's a great way to say it. So, um, if you measure, if you measure um, the furthest from your board harness and measure a, a, a maybe a chip or something that's supposed to be getting five volts, if you measure it there and it's getting five volts, that's good. A lot of times that means you're going to be getting something higher at the power supply, though. Correct. That's what you have to keep in mind. Uh, or from the edge connector, that's another way, good place to check. Um, checking at the chips is probably the best place. So checking on a chip on the board is probably the best way to do it or on a part on the board because that way you know exactly what that chip's getting so you know if it's under voltage or over voltage. And like we talked about, voltage on chips, very important, right, Tim? Very, very important. So uh, let's see. 
Um, yeah, Real Hammer Billy Lee, you do need to match the correct color A board to the correct color B board with CPS2, and I believe that is correct. So, um, so that is correct. You will need to match the two to make sure that you've got all of that working properly. So there are they are region locked. But I mean, typically, Tim, I don't keep separate A and B boards. I keep them together. Yeah. Um, so all of my sets have an A and a B board. I don't I don't swap them out. We've done that before. Sure. sure. But in the past, in the past, but nowadays, I just swap the whole game. So um, YouTube Punk says the barcode comment was for arcades, not the CPS two. So. There you go. Okay. Oh, they barcode the arcades. I think he's talking about at that um, arcade that he was talking oh, about. Oh, the, all the 600 The 600, ones. yeah. So that's a really good way to do it in order to keep track of problems, right? Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Well, this... Man, I meant you could build a whole database really quickly if somebody reported a problem, you scan the barcode and type in what the problem is, right? Right. Great way to keep up good with it. Good deal. You know, I like the light system that um, Dave & Buster's used to have. Mm -hmm. The light system was great. Mm -hmm. Every arcade should have it. They've done away with that now. Right. Like, I don't think they have that anymore. But it used to be that there was a switch on every game that um, it would it would do it had a service or it had like right. um, uh, I think a problem. Mm -hmm. There was like one for food service and then one for like an issue. See, Remember that? Yeah. See, I think I kept reporting game issues, waiting for somebody to bring me a drink. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so it was like I think they had to do away with it. They're like, Maybe. It, it, you know, this game has no problem. I thought that was the coolest thing though, because yeah, you could you cool. could flip the the like food service and, and saw somebody it. And, and the light would light up and somebody and, would come get you, bring you food. And you wouldn't put your money in that one because you'd see the light was right. If somebody turned it. it off, then yeah, you could see that there was a problem, and a tech would come over and check it. They've done away with that since, but I always thought that was one of the coolest things at Dave and Buster's. So. Uh, let's see. Um, Big D Retro says the new arcade pastimes is actually in Grand Ohio, is what he says. So um, okay. there, I don't know. You know, there's a lot of arcades with different names too. Right. So I mean, you just never know. So I mean, a lot of these guys. I noticed like the arcade is becoming a really big name for arcades. <laughs> so you know, the arcade or whatever. So, but um, anyway, so let us continue on here, Tim. We have a couple more questions here before we get through. So the okay. next one we have is from Jamie. And Jamie writes, I own a Deer Hunting USA arcade cabinet, and a while back, all my high scores and gun calibration disappeared. I assumed from lack of regular use, someone had said it might need a battery change. So my question my question is, are they correct? Does the board have a battery, and can it be changed? Thanks, Jamie. So, Tim, we have Jamie here. He has a Deer Hunting USA arcade cabinet, and he's wondering if there is a battery on the board, and that's the reason he lost all of his settings. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, let's continue on. No, no seriously. It's really? Right. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. Every time I see this question, I think about that episode of Seinfeld when George didn't want to unplug the Frogger game uh, because it would lose all of his, all of his set high scores, right? So, yes, it, it, there is a battery on there. Um, it looks like a watch battery, you know, one of, one of the round uh, poker chip looking ones. Whatever. Coin cell. Yeah, a coin cell battery. So it's not like, uh, it shouldn't be like double A's or triple A's, although it could be if they've replaced it or they've done some modifications. Usually it's right almost in the heart, middle of the board. Uh, and so you're just going to have to replace that. But your stuff is probably lost until you do that. Same thing with PC-based. I mean, based. it'll be lost. Right. Same thing with PC-based systems, guys. Like, if you have a PC-based, a lot of times there's a CR2032 coin cell battery on the on the motherboard. And so if that goes out, if you don't play the game, it does actually kind of charge sometimes when the game's in play. But if you don't play it for a while, that battery will wear down. And once it dies, you will lose a lot of your BIO settings on a computer. Same kind of thing with, um, with these kind of boards. And so uh, let's go ahead and throw this up here, Tim, so we can kind of talk about it. Yes, Deer Hunting USA does have a battery on the board, and it's possible that this battery is responsible for your last settings. And Tim, I took a picture of the board that I found mm -hmm. online, and we have it there, and you will see that coin cell battery. And so try replacing that battery. See if it saves your settings after the replacement. Although we do not know for sure what the model of the battery is, I do believe it's a CR2032 battery, which is commonly used in arcade board and PC hardware. Of course, it's probably best to remove the battery that's currently installed on the board and replace it with a new one of the same model number. Tim, the nice thing is that a lot of these coin cell batteries are readily available now, mm -hmm. especially if you have like a Batteries Plus or some other battery Yeah, I usually buy like a five or ten pack. Yeah, exactly. Because we use them, you know, we use them all the time now, key fobs yeah. on your car. So it's the same battery. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so I would highly recommend one thing that we talk about is um, in this, he probably had some good scores and stuff like that. It, and some of you are more play as much a player as you are a repair. We're more repair. Some of you are really good players. Um, if that's important to you, uh, one thing we always recommend is when the time change happens, uh, usually what in October or when the daylight savings time changes, that's a good time to just go ahead and replace batteries on any of your boards before they do die because once they die 
Yes, you can replace them, but a lot of times, especially like on computers, John, you know this, you have to go back in the settings, you have to do a lot of changes. It really becomes a big hassle, a lot more hassle than just switching out a battery real quick. So at least once a year if you can, but uh, twice a year if, if it's something that important to you and you want to save that, I recommend doing it just every time time changes. Just kind of like your um, your uh, fire smoke, detector. smoke detectors in your house. It's a good time to remember to do that. Always keep spare batteries around. It's kind of what I do. Sounds good, Tim. And, I mean, it, it's never a bad idea to keep this around. Now, Tim, some... Some people, like with pinball machines now, we've gone to these like flash memory style MV RAM chips, yes. which, which will allow you to basically save all your settings without having to replace the battery. And so you could always, if your board supports that, or if you have one for that, you could get one of those as well, the NV RAMs, um, and, which is basically a flash, flash memory module, which mm -hmm. is really handy. And so it, you know, it, it's, it doesn't need a battery to, to remember all the settings and everything like that. So if you may see if there's one for this board. I didn't see if there was or not. I know that for a lot of pinball machines though, Tim, a lot of people have gone to the NV RAM style chips. So. So, Correct. But, Jamie, yes, that probably is your problem. So replace that battery and let us know if the settings continue to have issues from there. Okay, Tim, well, we are to the part of the show where we do the quick question and answer. So this right. is where we do our rapid fire at Tim. And, Tim, we have two from the same guy who actually left um, these questions right after the live show last week. So you okay. just barely missed it, Weez34. You barely missed the live show last week. Couldn't get those questions in. But he did leave the comments right there in the last live show. So we want to answer those tonight. And we also have one from... it. A guy that sounds like he's a Volkswagen guy, uh, as far so. as I can tell. <laughs> so with that said, let us go to our quick questions and answers for this episode. And so, again, this is Wee's 34 His first question is, Tim, I have a House of the Dead 4 upright. When I lay when I start the game, neither gun works. I check the plug in, uh, in where the guns lay on the stand, and they are properly plugged in. Could this be the board? So, again, non-working guns with a House of the Dead 4, could it be the board? His other question is he has a Silent Scope 2 dark silhouette, and there's no video in the scope. So for those of you guys who have played Silent Scope, you know there's a big screen with the video on it, but there's also a scope screen that you look for look through he's saying he's having no screen on the scope tip okay and then last we got vw guy and he says the screen on my golden tee has a yellow color instead of green will anything fix that so again house of the dead four no working guns tim could it be the board silent scope two no video in the scope and vw guy why is my green yellow on my golden tee game so let's take these one at a time here tim and see if we can figure out what's going on so the first one house of the dead four tim upright game guns not working could it be a board issue probably i mean it could be sure and so we want to make sure go into the input test and check the calibration and check all do all the tests first but if so it could be so that's probably our good place good place to look especially with both of them not working like that uh there's probably a chip in that area or something but um I definitely would suspect that, but let's go through your test menu first and make sure that everything's calibrated and set right. Absolutely. Second thing here from Wii's 3410 was a silent scope to scope screen not working. What can we do? Well, the the neat thing about that is is that he there's two connectors that, that go on the board. One is for the big screen and one is for the tiny screen. And I think he can swap them if you jumper it, if you use the right jumper, and you can actually see if the problem moves, then you know you have a board problem, or if the problem stays, then you would know that it's probably your little screen in there or something like that. Gotcha. The last thing for VW guy is my yellow is, or my green is yellow on my golden tee game. So I guess he's seen a lot of yellow um, uh, golf courses, Tim. So what yeah. can he do? <laughs> what can he do in order to uh, fix that issue? Well, again, the first thing to do is to go into the test and see if it actually is testing right. And then you can adjust the color, try to see if you can dial it in. If not, then you probably need to send it to our good friend Paul or somebody like that because you probably need some repair work done on it or do a cap kit or something yourself. Sounds good. So, with all that said, guys, let's go ahead and review what Tim just said. So, very first thing, Weez 34, it's possible you do have a board issue with that House of the Dead 4 with the non-working guns. First thing to check would be the input test and calibration and speed check in the test menu. Okay, also see page 130 of the manual for some troubleshooting ideas. Tim, we have a link to the manual here. Page 130 actually runs you through some things you can do if your guns are not working. Awesome. So, um, but if you go into the input test and you're not seeing the gun or you're not the trigger's not registering, or you go into the calibration and speed check and you don't see anything, then you may have a board issue like we talked about. Very possible, but let's try the test menu settings and some of those troubleshooting ideas from the manual first and see where we at after see where we are after that. So 
on the Silent Scope 2 issue Weeds 34. Check the continuity of the connectors and wires that run between the scope screen and the video board. You can also switch the video boards with the main screen, okay? And this is what Tim was talking about. So you can actually switch the the um, the video boards and the, basically the connectors. If you switch the connectors around and then you um, you move jumper 37D, you can see if it starts. Basically, you get something on the scope screen, but now you don't have something on the main screen. If that's the case, then you probably have a video board issue of some sort. But if the problem if the problem basically stays the same, then you may actually have a screen issue. The LCD in your and your scope could be bad, right, Tim? Correct. And so that's what you, that's what we're looking for with that. So again, let's check the continuity first, though, and then try switching the video boards with the main screen, and then move jumper 37D to see if that swaps the problem or if the problem stays the same. That's what we're looking. Very good. For. And then VW guy, okay, sounds like a monitor adjustment, right, Tim? Mm -hmm. So let's use the video screen test in the test menu, which pretty much every Golden T has, and let's adjust the monitor and dials dial in your colors based on that screen. Okay, if you do that, that'll help you out a lot. Now, if it's still quite yellow, I mean, it could be a bad tube. You know, mm -hmm. it could be some other issues. And so you could, like Tim mentioned, send your chassis off for repair. That's an option. Um, you could try a tube rejuvenation at that point. But always, Tim, we want to try to dial in that, those colors before we start suspecting a chassis issue or anything else, right? For sure. Okay, sounds good. So hopefully we've answered all those questions. We 34 and VW Guy, if you have any other um, any other things that you want to comment about your issues, please let us know. Send us a, an email, and we'll try to get back with you when we can. So, uh, again, thanks for sending those in. And uh, there we go, Tim. Good good uh, job on the rapid-fire questions this <laughs> evening. So, Thank you. Okay. The next thing we have is Tim's travel section, and we teased this earlier in the show. So Tim was in Amarillo, Texas this past month, and while you were there, Tim, you visited an arcade bar like you normally do. Yes, I did. Um, I, I will preface with that it was downtown, and um, I, there was parking was limited. Uh, I had to parallel park, which, you know us, we don't parallel park much around here. Nope. And... Um, so, you know, if, if that's a little uncomfortable for you, know this, that you might have to park at least two or three blocks and walk. Um, the parking right next to it was really hard to get to. And it did was kind of getting late, so I didn't get a lot of time to play much. Okay. And I didn't feel like I wanted to be downtown, not in a town that I didn't know. It, I seemed pretty safe. I'm not saying it was sketchy or anything. I'm just saying for, and I think it was Friday and I was kind of tired. But um, anyway, I want to talk about this bar. I, I thought it was really cool. Uh, it was pretty good size. And uh, it was a lot bigger than it looked in the front. And uh, once I got in there, I was... In, and then some of the games I thought were really unique and unusual. And uh, they actually had some pinball games I really wasn't expecting. Usually you see, even if they have newer stuff, it's the newer common stuff. Yeah. Not uh, really kind of different stuff so we'll show some pictures here in a second well let me go ahead and throw those up here tim so you can kind of walk us through them real quick so um the name of the place was lit arcade bar in amarillo texas we have a link down below if you guys want to see it uh youtube punk is singing on the road again tim here. okay yeah <laughs> on the road again yeah tim's on the road again so the first the first picture we have here just looks like kind of the giving us some, a general idea of what the setup was like right yeah so what i what i wanted to show is an actual bar right. i mean it has a good uh seating around there they had drinks they had food and stuff uh, I didn't try anything there, uh, but I thought to myself, you know, if so, if you're with somebody and let's say they're not into arcade games, but they don't mind, then you could see in the back they had some screens going, that some music videos playing and stuff. So I think that anybody would be pretty comfortable there. And then the, the second picture I took, because I just thought it was interesting that they were actually running a Pandora's Box 6. Uh, so a lot of games you can play with that, right? Yeah, very interesting. We haven't seen too many, um, too on, many Pandora's box on location. Yeah, I don't know what that cabinet used to be, but as you can tell, pretty big cabinet next to another track and field, right? Yeah, track and field may be the game of the, of the <laughs> night tonight, Tim. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next little set of pictures here, so I'll bring this up. So we got some pinball machines here. Okay, you have to. My eyesight's just straining me. It looks like was so that I have a an attack from Mars. I have a medieval madness and a monster bash. It looks right. Like. So three really popular games, um, and nobody was playing them. These look like the remakes. Um, yeah. Just looking at them, they do not look like the original. I was going to say that that all of these I think were remakes, but still a lot of lot of coin uh, money dropped on these games. Uh, they had the newer style Pong game. Which they have here at um, Grand Slam, too. Yes. And that's a really fun game. Um, I'm really terrible at it, but it is fun to play. Yes. <laughs> it was, uh, and it seemed to be popular. I saw people playing it uh, over some other games. Um, 
and then we had I just saw it was a cool Tetris sitting there. Uh, you don't see a Tetris in the wild very right, often right next these to days. Dig Dug, right? Yep, right next to Dig Dug. So let's go ahead and go on through here. We've got um, so it looked like this corner they had a TV with Bob Ross on it. I see. Yeah, and, and, Bob yeah. Ross painting. I thought that was kind of <laughs> kind of fun. You know, you just it was just kind of fun to sit there and watch it. Uh, I like I, I like to take pictures sometimes of the decor because I always think somebody's mind what's going through their head when they they did this. Uh, the picture right down there is an actual painting of um, Back to the Future, and there you know it's a painting somebody did of them. Is I think you got an I got a better one. picture of that coming now, up. These two games on the right, there are two of the games that I have not gotten to play that I really want to try. One of them is Rick and Morty, which is from Spooky Pinball, right? And then yes. we also have um, Foo Fighters, which is brand yes. new from Stern. So did you get to play these? I did get to play the Rick and Morty and a, a, maybe a, about a half a game of Foo Fighters, to be honest. Um, the Rick and Morty I really liked. I okay. thought that was a lot of fun. Uh, you can definitely tell it's kind of that spooky pinball vibe that they always have neat stuff with theirs. I don't know. Just I, I, I was almost um, looking at it more than playing it. I thought it was really cool and was really shocked to see that game there. I wasn't expecting. Agreed, yeah. I, I expect even that newer Stern, but I was just like, wow, there's Rick and Morty in here. And I was like, that was kind of cool. I try to get a good shot of the play field. A very busy game. And I think that that's what I was like, okay, I don't have a lot of time. Uh, this game is going to take some time to really get into. I just kind of got a quick play of it. And I did like it. I thought it was cool. Uh, definitely, um, you know, you most, most places you go, you really can't hear them that loud because yeah. they don't want all the volume up. Uh, this is one of those games uh, that I thought, I wish I was playing this at home and I could hear everything. So I will have to get back to you after I get a chance to play one a little more close up. Okay. And the Foo Fighters just generally, what would you think? I mean, you said about half a game on it. What would you think of it? Yeah, that's what, the, I actually was talking about the Foo Fighters because oh, okay, of gotcha. the sound and the okay. music. I could hear it, but it's so lot low. I was like, I really would love to get the full experience. I, I kind of got a little, it was so much busy that I kind of got a little, I was like, I just don't have time right now. Gotcha. Let us go on here. Now, this is a Cosmotrons, Tim. This is a um, this is a newer style cabinet that's very popular right now. Did you get to play this? Or you just I did pictures? not play this okay. one. Um, I just thought it would look cool, and I, I hadn't seen one before. Uh, kind of a, uh, a Asteroids type feel, but yet newer game. And it just looked cool. I thought, i got to take some pictures of this. If anybody's played that, let me know. This would definitely look like a good two-player game. I wish I'd have had a buddy there like you, and we would have played it. Absolutely. Okay, now, Tim, we have, um, it looks like um, Deadpool here next to the Rick and Morty. Yes. And then we have a Zaxxon, a Centipede, and a Pac-Man. Now, these three, I think, were underneath the Bob Ross TV, right? Yes, kind of over in that corner area. They definitely had the general classics that if you just like to play those. But, you know, you still don't see Zaxxon everywhere, and I liked it. And the Gauntlet was really nice. Uh, I thought this, and if you, as you can tell by the pictures, everything was in really good condition. A lot of restoration work had already been performed, um, and they were all playing. I didn't see anything that wasn't working. Um, now, YouTube Punk said, did you get to meet the owner? I did not. Um, like I said, um, you know, typically I was probably there about eight o'clock on a Friday night, and I'm sure they were probably gone by then. Uh, didn't really even talk to many people. Um, just kind of was in and out pretty probably within about 30 minutes okay let's go on and see a little bit more here now we have a quite a few pinball machines here i see a metallica um let's see is that a ripley's there i can't really yeah uh, indiana jones indiana, yeah, indiana jones, jones the and newer then several one. other pinball machines down the way yeah there's um, just a lot to play and as you can see there was nobody playing them a lot of people were there drinking and not playing and then we have a, the all whole, the mortal combat right yeah. now the thing about this picture that kind of i don't know if it upset me but they all have flat screens in them yeah i was like oh everyone yeah <laughs> every single one of them which guys i understand like it's way easier to do the flat the flat screens in those and everything and they are the dedicated cabinets tim which i appreciate but it would have been nice to have at least one with a crt in there or something like that i think so and then we have a cyberball tim which i thought was pretty cool yeah don't not see that see one very, very often for yeah. sure. So, um, and then this last one was uh, Retro Raccoons, which is another newer game, Tim. Yes. So, did you get to play this or see it? I did. I did not play this one. I knew it was a kind of a newer game, but I just thought I'd take a picture of it. I thought it was cool because 
Um, if there, and, and this was a, it was a bar, but it didn't have the bar bar. Like you could took your kids. Sure. It didn't feel like you know, like a place you wouldn't want to take kids. And so they had a few kids games, and I thought that's why I took a picture of. It. I was like, you know what, this has this place has a good feel uh, to it. I wouldn't uh, wouldn't have thought anything about bringing a kid in there and let them play some games. So overall, you were impressed. Now you've been to a lot of arcades over like the last couple of months here. Is there, I mean, how does this one compare to some of the other ones that you've been I would to? say that what I really liked about this one was the space. It was really good and it looked like they rented it out for parties and stuff. So that would be fun. Uh, location was a little tough for me because it was way downtown, not much parking. Um, so on that note, I'm sure that, um, you know, there were places you could park and walk and, uh, if I'd have had more time, in fact, next time I go back, I'll try to go during the after, really early afternoon where I'll get a chance to play more. Uh, but definitely a good variety, for sure. Um, you just don't, you know, good good old school, new school. There's a few other games I didn't take a picture of. Um, but, they were, you know, overall, I thought, you know, it's a good thumbs up. I mean, it was a good place. And I, I think, it, and everything was about two, everything took tokens, by the way. So there oh, were wow. no, okay. no game cards. Uh, so you got to actually put a token in there. And most games are two tokens to play. Kind of old school, buy 10, you get 50 or whatever. And so I think it was a pretty good deal, too. It seemed, seemed, to, seemed like a fair price. And um, like I said, everybody was friendly. It was a good place. I think with the token uh, with the token things, I think there's a lot of our audience that would really appreciate that, right? Exactly. Because, I mean, there's something about a throwback with the tokens. Yeah, and you sure. hear the coin go the through coin the back and right. stuff like that. So... Um, I like. I kind of did like that about it. You know, some of the newer ones with just cards just doesn't feel the same. Agreed. Um, YouTube Punk says younger audiences won't even notice the flat screens. Um, uh -huh. You know, current phonograph. I prefer CRT too. Um, let's see. How close was it to Westgate Mall? YouTube Punk asks. Okay, I would say about ten miles, and the reason why I know that is because Westgate Mall was right by my hotel. Okay. And right by my hotel. In fact, I could have walked to that mall. So about 10, 10 miles, not not much further. It's in downtown Amarillo, so literally in the middle of downtown. Um, the only skyscrapers they have are right there. Sure. So sounds good. Um, so oh, <laughs> YouTube Punk says, "Oh, I want their tokens. Did they have custom tokens?" You know, that's odd that I didn't even check that. I don't think so. It would have okay. caught. I think that would have caught my attention, and I didn't really check. I didn't. I, I'm just I no apologize. Cash value, guys. Yeah. I think they were pretty generic to think of it, but I will I will definitely check. I should have checked for that, but I didn't even think. It obviously probably was generic or it would have caught my attention, and I probably would have kept one too. Agreed. So, um, Before we move on to the rest of our uh, news segment here, Tim, John said, I recently learned the numbers following the first two letters are an indication of the coin cell battery's dimensions, Tim. Oh. So, um, diameter in millimeters is indicated by the first two in a four-digit code, or just the first in a three-digit code. The last two numbers indicate the height of the battery in tenths of a millimeter. So, a 2032 is what he's saying. Millimeter. Right, 20 millimeter, um, let's see, in diameter, and then would have um, the height of the battery be the 32 millimeter. So a 20 millimeter token game would take a battery. Yeah, they got, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Maybe. Figure out, it, exactly. They kind of uh. figure out what it is. So, but uh, there you go. Yeah. Um, so very interesting. I did not know that. So you learn something new every day, Tim, for sure. So okay. Again, reminder that I'll be in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, South next, Dakota next week, leaving Sunday, and so I'll be checking out maybe some games in that area. If anybody has any recommendations, please let me know. Yeah, you can reach Tim. We have, we don't always say this. Questions at ArcadeRepairTips.com goes to both of us. But if you just want to reach Tim, Tim at ArcadeRepairTips.com goes to him. So yeah, if you go Tim at ArcadeRepairTips.com via email. Attention, Tim. That's, I'll, I'll get it. That's right. So you can just, you can send it to the questions address or you can send it to the Tim address at ArcadeRepairTips.com. Either one will get to him. So. Are we giving away anything today? I don't know. Should we give away one of these? I would give away one of them at least. Okay. we got two things. I do. You're but, not going to use know. them. Oh, we got a call? Is this the call? This is me. I will step out. John will get, give something away. Okay, I'm going to give something away. I guess Hello? I am. Um, so, yeah, let's give something away here. Actually, I'll give I'll give this one away. So, uh, for those of you guys who are here in the... As, in the lot for the live show as you guys usually know we usually give away something at every live show recently and so uh today we've already given away one of these but it was probably the most popular thing that we gave away we were going to be giving away another heat gun uh, this is a pulsivo heat gun this is really great for you know doing your heat shrink or removing uh, artwork 
control panel overlays, things like that. In order to win this heat gun, you will need to send an email to contest at arcaderepairtips.com. And I think we'll call the keyword word memorial for Memorial Day. So send us an email, contest at arcaderepairtips.com with keyword memorial somewhere either in the subject or in the body. Make sure you put your shipping address in there because I hate to write you back and have to get your shipping address. Uh, we don't sell your information. We keep it right here. Um, it's all private. We don't give it to anybody else. So if you will send us an email, contest at arcaderepairtips.com with your shipping address and the keyword memorial, you will be entered to win this nice heat Pulsivo heat gun, which I, like I said, has several different uses and can come in very handy in your arcade repair endeavors. So again, contest at arcaderepairtips.com, keyword memorial, put your shipping address in there and one of you guys is going to win this thing. We already shipped out some ad, um, some prizes from the last couple of live shows. I actually got behind a little bit, but those went out. And so I hope that uh, all of the winners did receive their items. Uh, good stuff there, guys. We always like to give you guys a chance to win whenever you guys watch. We want to reward you for watching, and this is one way we can do that. So uh, send us that email, contest at arcaderepairtips.com, keyword memorial with your shipping address, and you will be entered to win that. Uh, we do have some... We do have some uh, news articles to go over. I will go over some of those because I don't think that uh, Tim will have too much to chime in on on some of these. But I did want to, uh, this one in particular I think is very interesting. So let's go ahead and go over this one real quick, guys. So The Economist put out an article this week on pinball is booming in America thanks to nostalgia and canny marketing. And so there were a lot of interesting things that came from this article, but uh, I'll go ahead and read the synopsis here so you guys can hear it. 20 years ago, pinball seemed to be circling the drain, yet today pinball is thriving again both at places like Logan Arcade and in people's homes. What's driving the boom? Much of it is nostalgia. A generation raised on pinball and arcades in the 80s and 90s are now at an age where they have disposable income and kids with whom they want to play the game they played with their they played as children. Now, this is probably the most interesting part of this article to me was that Zach Sharp of Stern Pinball mentioned that sales of new machines have risen by 15 to 20 percent every year since 2008. 15 to 20 percent. That's a huge increase every year since 2008. Now, the question really is, do you think the boom will continue? And uh, we had a lot of people on our Twitter chime in about this, which I found very interesting. And so I'm going to go ahead and put up some replies from some of the people we had on Twitter so you guys can read them. Um, but yeah, this was very interesting, I thought anyway. So Arcade Heroes, our friend Adam, who runs Arcade Heroes website, said the problem from the operator side is that this boom is not translating into more coins in the cash box. It's mostly collector driven. Those collectors won't go to an arcade or bar to play unless unless they're seeing if it's the game they want. At least they'll always have resale value. And so I think what a lot of these guys here are saying is that while there is a pinball boom, it's mostly driven by private collectors and it's not driven by by operators, okay? Which is something Stern always preached in the past was that the operator platform was a big was a big part of their business, maybe the biggest part of their business, but it really seems that that, that has turned a corner in, in recent years and that it has been, become more of a collector market and it's the collectors driving the price. And we get a couple of chime-ins from a couple of other people like Pixel Palace Arcade. They say, yeah, I was just telling my wife the exact same thing after reading the article. It's a bit misleading. And then Retro Ralph chimed in and said, I was thinking the same thing. I was always curious if if this was really driving higher revenues for pinball heavy locations. I wish we could get more data on this. I feel the collector slash at home user is really driving the business for pinball manufacturers. And then Derek chimed in, also my experience. I have a very nice game room in a restaurant with around 50 pins. And the only way I can get people to play them consistently is by putting them on free play. So it really does seem like this boom is being driven by the private market. And so whereas, like I said in the past, it has been more of a collector market. And and it really is kind of uh, disappointing in a way because you still, if you want to see pinball machines out in public, then you know you have to have people playing them. And guys, we've talked about this before. Pinball requires a ton more maintenance than what you get with a standard with a standard arcade game. Arcade games are very simple. There's not a lot that can go wrong with them. They're pretty easy to repair. Whereas with pinball machines, of course, you've got switches, you've got wiring, you've got um, you've got PCB parts and all that kind of stuff in there. And so you know, there's a lot of repair and maintenance that goes into pinball machines. Not nearly as much with arcade machines. And so from an operator standpoint, if you have a lot of pinball machines and a lot of people aren't playing them. Well, that just means that you're not making as much money as you can make if you just replaced all your pinball with arcade games. And so, you know, 
it does but again that may depend on the operator and what kind of location you have there are several pinball heavy locations i believe are that are fine and that are doing good business but it definitely seems like more of a rarity than it used to be and so with that said um it just really depends i think on the location more than anything but again pinball requires a lot of maintenance and so uh, you know, if it were me, you know, in most of our locations, we only had maybe one or two pinball machines, maybe four at the most. And we've re we really went to more of an arcade heavy um, setup Yikes. because of that. So, oh, Tim's back. Sorry about that. That's okay. You got everything uh, settled? Well, somewhat. They were like, wait and call us after the flight is all done. I'm like, I need, a, I need an answer tonight, but it's all right. We'll okay. figure it out. Sounds good. Well. We just uh, we just went over the article from the Economist about pinball booming in America, and I kind of kind of talked about uh, there were a lot of operators here who chimed in who said basically they're not seeing that from their end. Yeah, they're not seeing people playing more pinball out on location. It seems like all well, of this is being driven by collectors. Yeah, look at the look at the uh, uh, pictures I showed. Do you see anybody playing pinball? I could have played any game I, if I'd had the time. Sure, I could have played and played and played. There was a couple guys playing pinball out of the twenty that were there or more. Um, so I agree. It's 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 more about collectors who are buying them up. You remember when we would go to Texas Pinball Festival and we would uh, Gary Stern would give his thing and he always talked about how important the operator market is. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem like it's as as important as it used to be. Obviously, there are still pinball machines out on location. Tim has shown quite a few of them in his travels. But like Tim mentioned, the play is just not there in a lot of cases, and these things are expensive. Yeah, and the maintenance is it takes high. a lot of plays to play play back. Um, that's why, you know, it's almost hard if you can have access to a place like that to go play. It almost doesn't make sense to buy one. Exactly. Because you, you save a lot of money by just playing $10 a week or whatever you want to play and playing different machines. Absolutely. So we'd love to hear you guys' thoughts. Um, you know, are you, do you, when you, are you buying our pinball machines? Maybe you are. If you are, let us know. Or are you the kind of person who goes to a location to play pinball machines? Or would you just rather play arcade games? I mean, maybe you're in that boat. You just don't have the fondness for pinball that some people have. Tim, I was like that for a long time. I really didn't have a lot of fondness for pinball. I, I, I preferred arcade games. I probably still prefer arcade games to an extent. But pinball machines are fun too. I love to play a good pinball machine too. Notice I said I didn't play anything, but. A few couple of pinball games. Sure. So that's the one thing I wanted to play. I've yeah. played Saxon a lot. Oh, I sure. wanted to play and that's I wanted to play the newer ones, right? But you saw like Retro Raccoons and Cosmotron. I There's thought some they were ones, cool. I, I thought they say. were really cool to to look at, but I when I limited time I played pinball. But then again, that's just a preference, right? Yeah. So yeah. I mean, um, so a couple of uh, things here. Um, YouTube Punk says, yeah, it's gotten more bougie, he says. <laughs> okay. Um, Joe says, can we agree to stop with the rock and roll theme pins? Uh, unless it's Mike and the Mechanics. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Mike and the Mechanics pinball machine for the win. Uh, current Phonograph says, I think pinball has much potential because it's hard to replicate the experience on your television or computer game console. That is true. It has gotten better for sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have the arcade one up pinball table. And while it's not perfect, it's not bad. I mean, it's actually fun to play. Tim's played. We played some yeah. games on, if you guys remember a couple of live shows back, probably, what, a year or two ago when I got it. I mean, we played some games on it. It's fun. Yeah. It really is. I mean, so it's not like playing regular pinball, but I still love playing it. So, um, let's see. The Geek Light 08. I suck at pinball, so it's just digital pinball for me. That may be you too. Uh, YouTube Punk says the cost barrier to entry for pinball is too steep. Very true. That is very <laughs> true. Big D Retro, I don't have any real pinball machines, but um, but will at the end of the year. Always wanted one real one for the home. Yeah, so I think a lot of people are like that. I want like four arcade games and one pinball machine. Now, right? one, one thing to note, and most of us are here in the continental U United States, when every time I hear them talk about selling pinball games, they're selling a ton of them overseas. That's true. And that's where they still seem to be popular in bars and things like that. So, um, you know, we have to think globally. And, um, you know, if I was selling pinball games, I wouldn't care where they were going either. If they, As long as I'm selling them and somebody's paying the shipping. Right, exactly. Um, Delusional says, I just bought my first pin two months ago, a 1978 Strikes and Spares. Yeah, that's about all I can afford right now. Right. <laughs> right, something like a 1978. Because, um, man, the... Um, Tim, I don't know if you saw in that article, I, I was telling them the most interesting part is that since 2008, sales of new machines have risen by 15, per 20, uh, 15 and 20% per year. That's, wow. That's yeah, good. that's a lot of growth. I don't think it can continue like that. I think eventually the market will settle. 
Okay, but that's the question. Um, Big D Retro says his pinball that he's getting is the Godzilla Premium. Okay. Nice. So let's jump to that then. Since we're talking <laughs> about a, Godzilla. What, what a transition. A segue, yeah. That's right. Segway. So just this week, we got a PR announcement from, uh, from Stern Pinball. Let's go ahead and talk about this here, Tim. So, Stern Pinball launches full line of Godzilla pinball machine accessories. Okay, so Stern Pinball has announced a full line of Godzilla pinball machine accessories. The most interesting one is the Godzilla Heat Ray Destruction Topper. This topper will cost nine, $999.99, Tim. Not a thousand. $999.99. Okay. This includes an exclusive King of the Monsters Time Attack mode. So, Tim, my question is what do you think of this? Isn't this basically a form of downloadable content for pinball machines? And what does it do to the third-party topper market? Okay. So, um, Tim, what are your thoughts on this topper that adds a game mode to the original pinball machine? I think it's a good idea because... For a uh, thousand bucks? Well, that... I don't, I don't have a Godzilla that I've already paid off. Sure. If I had, then maybe another thousand. I don't know. It seems seems kind of expensive. But it's also a good way, let's say you bought the lower model and now you can get the cool topper sure. for the price of one that has all the stuff on it. Maybe it's, I can see some pros and cons uh, to both sides of that. The third market, I think some people are going to get it because they want to be the only one that has it or uh, they like that game. I've, it's a very popular game. Yes, it is. And it's a very fun game to play. The ones I play well, are very of, fun. There's a lot of companies out there that are making toppers for the game, right? But none that can none do that add add the those. mode, so right? Exactly. That's the difference. Right, exactly. So that that is the thing. And so, like, if you're a third-party seller who's been selling toppers for Godzilla and then Stern announces this thing, like... Do you do you even sell some? Obviously, the third party toppers are cheaper, right? But they're not going to add the additional mode either. So no, not everybody's going to pay a thousand dollars. I think true. there's a mo market for both. I think some people are going to want every bell and whistle they can get, and other people are just going to want to add a little or even make their own. There you right. go. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, let's get a let's get a couple things in here. Let's see. Uh, Godzilla. Okay, Nate says Godzilla costs fourteen fourteen thousand Canadian. Uh, at one dollar per play, it'll take fourteen thousand to break even, and it will cost hundreds to fix until I, I get to fourteen thousand operators need more pinball players to play. I mean, think about it. fourteen thousand Canadian dollars, Tim. Yeah, that's a lot. So, well, and know, I know that now, right now, the um, the the um, what do you call it? The exchange market for the U.S. is very favorable. I know this because I'm going to Canada this summer, mm -hmm. Tim. So it's like I know we're very favorable. Still, fourteen thousand dollars Canadian is not cheap. So, and if you've no. got it on location, it takes a lot of plays to hit it. So, uh, let's see. Razor Show says, uh, my Foo Fighters arrive next week. Nice. So, a lot of people buy new pinball machines, Tim. So, there you go. Uh, let's see. Um, Delusional says, uh, make no mistake, that pin plays fast. So, um, I, I don't know if he's talking about Foo Fighters or Godzilla, one or the other. Uh, let's see. Um, they want $1,700 for a rush topper. Too much money. You guys need to... Uh, debate it. So uh, no debate tonight. <laughs> I, so. I decided not to, Tim. I didn't put together a debate. I'm sorry. Okay. No fighting tonight. No infighting. Mm -hmm. But um, it is a good point. I mean, like $1,700 for a topper. That's Ooh. a lot of money. I'm telling you. So that is a lot of money. So um, let's see what else we have here. Compared to Black Knight topper and Rush topper, this is terrible. It uses the same figure from the game, uh, Nate says. Um, let's see. Delusional says he enjoyed Foo Fighters. So, um, and loves Pulp, Pulp Fiction, which I haven't got a chance to play, but a lot it, yeah. of people have said good things about that one. Um, Razor Show there really, says there really hasn't been any bad reviews of Foo Fighters yet. So, any version. So, okay. look, music pins are fine. Um, I know that they keep making them, but there's a reason they keep making them, right, Tim? It's because right. they work, and people buy them. So, I mean, look, if you don't want, if you don't want to see more music pins, tell people to stop freaking buying them. So, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the solution right there. And here's the, hey, if you've never played, and I know ACDC kind of kicked this whole thing off, but if you've never played an ACDC, it's a lot it, of fun. It is awesome. <laughs> oh my goodness, it is fantastic. So, I mean, like, so as long as they keep making good music pins, I'm okay with that. Foo Fighters is a good band, Tim. So there you go. Um, let's see. Oh, a Delusional says Strikes and Spares plays, plays fast for an old pin. So there you go. There's a lot of older pins, Tim, that play quick. Mm -hmm. um, people may not realize because you know what's the whole idea behind behind a coin operated game Tim? to make money to take right? your money <laughs> that's right so I mean sometimes those things will play fast so 
Okay, well, let us get away from pinball for a second here, Tim. I'm going to go back to some of these that we had earlier because I kind of transitioned when you walked out the door so we could cover some earlier stuff. Thank you. But this has been probably the biggest news that we've had this month, and this was the Pac-Man Lego set, right? So um, Lego has now recreated one of the most popular arcade games of all time, which is 2,650-piece 1980 Pac-Man arcade cabinet set. Thanks to some clever engineering, this set even finds Pac-Man getting chased around the screen by Inky, Blinky, Pinky and Clyde. For its Pac-Man arcade machine, LEGO is delivering the same level of detail and interactivity, which was which will undoubtedly have you making that waka 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 sound effect every time you play it, which means it must not make sounds. Mm -hmm. But anyway, price for the set is $270. So Tim, what do you think? Do you spend $270 on a 2,650 piece Pac-Man LEGO arcade game? I don't think the price is that bad because I've seen what Lego sets go for. Oh, sure. Some of them can get really expensive. Agreed. I'm just not that big into Legos. I think it's fair. And I think if you're a Lego person, you really, why not? I would like it. I mean, I think it's cool. Make me one and send it to me. Absolutely. I mean, now Lego stuff is expensive. Now, $270, yeah. you can, you're you you're almost to an arcade one up there, too. Right. I mean, in some cases, you are to an arcade one up. And so, like, it makes you it makes you wonder. Now, the cool thing about Lego is you build it, which is always sure. fun. Of course, you build arcade one ups, too. Right. But, um, um, you know, it's like you build it, and it's fun to put together the bricks and have some, you know, fun. And it has a little crank on the side with some Technic, Tim. I don't know if you noticed that, yeah, to where it actually that. moves Pac-Man and the Ghost around. Now, <laughs> okay. it's, in a, it's in a pattern, right? Yeah. But you crank it, and it kind of simulates the game, which I think is pretty cool. So that that in itself is a pretty neat build. But um, I, it's too much for me. If they if it drops, I may think about it. Yeah. 270 is too high for me. I think that's like the asking price kind of deal. I'm like you. I've thought about it. if it drops down below 200. Yep. And you saw you saw the Atari one that they have is really cool. So maybe um, maybe it's worth it. And uh, I think I definitely think if somebody's a Lego person and an arcade person though, that probably. Probably is not a bad price point. Agreed. If you guys are um, watching this, if you're either watching this live or watching this after the fact, chime in either in the live chat or the comments and let us know if you plan on getting this. Because I'm really curious if you are or if you've pre-ordered it. I want to know how many people are out there doing it, Tim. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, let me catch up with the live chat here real quick. Uh, Tim, Delusional says, um, Foo Fighters theme should have been Voltron. The Lions version of Voltron, period. So mm -hmm. there you go. Uh, Joe Halt says, original games, only the retro... The Retro Beatles was pretty cool. You know, unlicensed games, though, recently haven't been... I don't think they've done very well sales-wise. I mean, Dialed In was, like, a big one, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think about Dialed In? And I thought the game was good, but, you know, it's almost, I almost feel like it kind of has... I mean, Black Knight technically wasn't a licensed game, per se. It was a Correct. pinball theme. I mean, it probably did pretty well, because a lot of people like Black Knight as a theme. But we haven't seen a lot of original titles, and I mean, th now there's some new pinball companies coming out with unlicensed stuff now, okay. and we've we've heard a about a couple of these. So I mean, you are going to see more unlicensed stuff. But as far as like the big the big three go, so you're talking about Spooky, Jersey Jack, and Stern. I don't think we're going to see much unlicensed from them. No, you know what I'm saying. You may it. every once in a while, maybe, but for the most part, license is the way to go, right? I think so. So it's what a lot of people are attracted to. Exactly. Uh, let's see. Voltron would would have been great for a pin instead of Foo Fighters theme is what Delusional is saying. So, yeah. uh, let's see. Um, yeah, YouTube Punk sound effects not included on the Pac Man arcade game. Okay. So you have to you have to do waka 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 as, as you do it. it. So yeah, it that kind of stinks. Exactly. So, anyway, so let us know if you guys are interested in buying that set. We'd love to know. Now, Tim, this next news story is about the National Video Game Museum, and they were able to acquire a rare Atari 4 slot, or slot 4 prototype arcade machine. Did you see this, Tim? I did. So um, so this is a really cool cabinet. And you'll notice all it has, basically, for each control, it's a four-player cabinet. All it has is a slider. And uh -huh. you know why? Right. This is a slot car game. So for you guys who have used slot car, do you, Tim, I remember the first slot car set I had. I just had a little remote with a little trigger on it. Right. And you'd pull the trigger back to go faster, or you'd let it go to go slower. If you pull the trigger all the way, your car would pretty much fly off of the track, right? <laughs> right. And so that's the whole thing behind this is it's the same kind of concept for a game. Um, the game itself is similar to Sprint 4 with multiple track choices. However, because it's a slot car game, there's all, there's no steering wheel, Tim. Instead, a single slide control is used for acceleration and speed. Go too fast on a turn and your car tumbles off the track before resetting your position. We're told this game was also designed with a bar setting in mind. Having a single control, the player is able to hold a beer, Tim, okay. or drink in the other hand while playing. Which is ingenious! Yes. Right? So this is, all games should be designed for one-handed play, right? <laughs> right? Exactly. I need a beer in one hand and my control in the other. That's right. how it is. And so, um, but Tim, you could see how this would be a lot of fun. I would, def and that makes me just want to go to the National Video, video 
uh, game museum just to play it. Exactly. Now, I don't know if they're going to have this out on the floor or not. I hope, hopefully, hopefully they will put it out. But, man, I mean, you know, slot car as a whole, when I was a kid, was really cool. The little physical ones that you put on the little um, electrified track and everything. Mm -hmm. But having something like this in a bar with four of your, or three of your other buddies around holding, you know, drinking and, and uh, you know, playing the slot I'm car game. I'm surprised it like didn't fun. take off. Absolutely. Yeah. So... But um, really cool cabinet, very rare prototype. I don't think I've ever seen one like that before, Tim. Mm -hmm. So it's a really cool piece uh, that the National Video Game Museum can add. Of course, Tim, I told you I went there. It's a cool place, and if you guys are ever in Fresco, you should go there because yeah. they've got all sorts of cool stuff there, and it's a really cool exhibit. So um, uh, it's, I'm glad that this ended up in their hands because, Tim, I know it's good hands. They'll restore it. They'll keep it in good condition for sure. So Very cool. Okay, um, Tim, we did have an announcement of a new, quote-unquote, new Mortal <laughs> Kombat game coming one. out. And Tim, I found this interesting, which is why I posted it, but Mortal Kombat 1 came out. And you're like, okay. well, Mortal Kombat one? 1 came out in 92 or something like right. that, right? Exactly. I remember well, that um, I don't know if you guys have kept up with the series, but Mortal Kombat 11, which was the last one, basically did a whole reset of the timeline. And so now we're back to Mortal Kombat 1, Tim. Here we are. So a new trailer has been released for Mortal Kombat 1, the next game in the fighting game saga. Based on the information provided so far, this seems to be a reboot of the series. Characters include Liu Kang, Scorpion Sub-Zero, Raiden, Kung Lao, uh, Kitana, Melina, Shang Tsung, and Johnny Cage. Tim, they're going to have a Jean-Claude Van Damme skin for Johnny Cage this time. Officially oh, licensed and everything. So you actually get to play as, um, as Jean-Claude, which is pretty cool. Other rumored characters. Apparently, um, there was a leak of some of the characters that may be coming. Okay. Include Quan Chi, which we know, Ermac and Takeda, which are all Mortal Kombat characters. But the interesting ones were Peacemaker, who's a DC character. Did okay. you watch the Peacemaker series on HBO Max? I have not seen it. Okay, John Cena plays Peacemaker. So I've... maybe we're going to get the John Cena Peacemaker. Okay. Um, Omni-Man from Invincible, which is a uh, superhero cartoon on Amazon Prime, also a comic book, Tim. I don't know if you're familiar with Omni-Man, nope. but you sh if you haven't, it's a great... Watch Invincible on Prime, read some of the comic books... Uh, it seems like the perfect hero to have, and then of course Homelander from the Boys, which is one okay. of the, which is you know basically a, a psychotic version of Superman. <laughs> Tim, this is what Homelander <laughs> is. Um, very interesting. So um, the game will be released on September 19th. There are already some gameplay trailers out here. Tim, I'm looking forward to trying this. I played a lot of Mortal Kombat 11, um, and it's a very good game if you've never played it, but. Um, I, I like that they're rebooting it. I think it's the right time. Um, and it's going to be a little bit different than the original Mortal Kombat because some things in the Mortal Kombat timeline have changed. So okay. that'll be very interesting. So um, hopefully I'm going to get a chance to play that. I don't know if I'll buy it right when it comes out, but probably pretty soon after. I do want to give it a whirl for sure. Uh, let's see. John says, I went to the National Video Game Museum while I attended the Texas Pinball Festival in Frisco. It was pretty awesome. Um, wish you guys could have made it. I would have liked to meet you. Yes, hopefully we can uh, be at one of these festivals sometime soon. Tim is always on the road going somewhere, right. and with the kids, it's hard for me to get away. And my, I mean, We're busy all the time, I feel like. We've always got stuff going mm -hmm. on. And so maybe we can plan to be at the Texas Pinball Festival next year. I do certainly miss it, for sure. It's just, man, March is a busy month. Just it overall. is. It's my wife's always birthday, is. all sorts of stuff going on. So hopefully we can do that at some point. Um, YouTube Punk says, J uh, JCVD skin, that's awesome. So, an Omni Man and Homelander, yes. So, if you're a fan of both those series, you don't you realize how cool that is to have both okay. those characters in there. So, okay, I'm gonna do a little reset here, Tim. Okay. Just real quick, and the reason why is because we've got some exclusive news. Exclusive, really do. exclusive, yeah. exclusive. Should I put like a big exclusive on the screen there? I need sure. like a big stamp or something like that. But um, give me just a second here. I'll compose myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, so we have some exclusive news to share with you guys, and this comes courtesy of our, our one of our um, community members, one of our longtime viewers and listeners, Tim, Martin Reinhardt. So he has been working on the Donkey Kong at the Strong Museum of Play and actually has given us a little bit of information to share with you guys about this large Donkey Kong and what it looks like and how it works. And so, Tim, I'm going to put up this scene so you guys can see it. So Martin writes, gents, love the show, longtime listener. I was very excited to see you cover our oversized Donkey Kong that we are building. It will be housed in our 90,000 square foot expansion, which will be home to the World Video Game Hall of Fame, Tim. So there you go. And an exciting, a new exciting interactive exhibit called Level Up. I wanted to write in and share with you that the cabinet is indeed full length. Before, we only thought that we would see the top of it, right, Tim? It right. looked like it was kind of cut off. But as you can see from the picture that Martin gave us, Tim, <laughs> it is it is built into a freaking bridge that you oh, walk cool. on, right. so, which is really cool. 
So um, it extends above and below a large bridge that passes over our new main entrance. It's been a fun and challenging project. You'll be happy to know they'll be running an original Donkey Kong arcade PCB, Tim. Right. Which is pretty <laughs> awesome. Combined with an upscaler, it will be displayed on a 100-inch uh, Nano Lumens dis pixel display like you see in New York City Times Square. Those screens that you see, Tim, right. that's the kind of screen that it has on it. Um, as the monitor. If you ever get a chance to visit Rochester, be sure to reach out for a behind-the-scenes tour of our collection. Take care. Tim, this makes me want to go to Rochester. That, that is an opening, and I have been to Rochester last year, and I will volunteer to go back. There I you go. See so, that. yeah, exactly. Now, Tim, literally today, I wrote I wrote Martin back and said, this is so cool. Thanks for sharing this. And he's like, I'm going to get you some more pictures. And nice. And so he sent some today uh -huh. yes. to us. Uh -huh. And so we have pictures of it. They've actually put the side art on, so you can see that in the, um, in wow. the first picture. You can actually see the side art on it. And then here you can see the front of the cabinet. Okay. I never would have guessed it was hanging off like that in the back end. That is so cool. It really is. It's I yeah. mean, it's really inventive. And yes. I love the way that they did that. And Tim, to be running off of an actual Nintendo Donkey Kong PCB <laughs> is just freaking awesome. And you can see, guys, where you're supposed to stand to play the game and the size of the cabinet. Right. You see that? <laughs> so that little platform, which is really cool with the Donkey Kong girders, but kind of being held up there with the uh -huh. little control panel on it, that's where you play. Right. And then you can see the entire cabinet um, in front of you and how big it is. Tim, you would barely come up to the, you and me would probably barely come up to the T molding on the control panel where right. that white stripe is across the top. Just it's a little bit of 20 feet tall, right? Yeah, something like yeah. that. It's really big. So. I mean, as you can see how cool this is, it is really awesome. I, I can't thank Martin enough for sharing these pictures with us because as soon as I got them, Tim, I got so excited about this thing. It for looks sure. amazing. And so um, we want to thank Martin for, for one, just being a longtime listener and viewer of the show, but also for sharing these amazing photos and information with us. Uh, I think, Tim, I think all of us need to make a trek now to Rochester to it. see this thing because, man, it looks incredible. ASAP. And um, we just want to, man, I tell you what, just big props to Martin and his team and all the people who have been involved in building this thing because it looks amazing for sure. And I, I'll tell you what, we'll deputize anybody that's in the area if they want, maybe Martin would let you take some pictures to give to us. Because he said he would actually even show us inside pictures and stuff like that. Right, so exactly. That would be awesome. And we would be glad to uh, temporarily hire. The pay is amazing. <laughs> um, I'll give you double what I get. <laughs> there you and, go. Um, and so. That if $5 any, that you got for eating the <laughs> last episode. Right. So, no, seriously, if anybody's in that area, we could tell them that you're also, we can maybe can connect you until we can get up there and get some actual more footage ourselves. But by sure, if you're visiting or, or touring that area, why not visit them and give them uh, some revenue that they need to keep this kind of stuff going. I think it's awesome. Agreed. Um, so we have, you know, a lot of people chiming in here saying pretty, pretty awesome. Um, the stairs are, are red in the background and that's pretty neat. You see the red yeah. stairs kind of going a up. A lot of thought went into this. Right. Um, need some barrels too. Now you got to remember that Nintendo helped with this. This was a project, a joint project with Nintendo. Right. So I mean, Nintendo had a lot of input on this too, uh, which I'm sure is part of why, you know, it kind of came out the way it did. Of course, obviously, like I said, Martin and all the people who are involved in this put in a lot of work to make this work. For sure. And Thank so, you. Um, current Phonograph says very cool. Uh, Razor shows us when is it playable. Don't know uh, yet when that's supposed to open. We In the original announcement, I think we had the date in there. I'm not for sure. Just off the top of my head, I should have put that in here. On the original one, though, we did have a date. I wanted to say it was like fall. It was, yeah, really. I, so, I was thinking later summer, but I right. may be wrong. <laughs> John says, how big is the token on that? Yeah, that's a good <laughs> question. Who knows? Uh, so um, probably a pretty big one you'd have to put in there. But uh, again, we want to thank Martin for sharing all this information with us and hit and and everybody that's involved with the building of this thing, thank you guys. This is an amazing project. And me and Tim, for sure, and I think everybody in the live chat, Tim, are are excited to see it one day, to go to the Strong Museum and play. Tim, it has been on my bucket list to go there. Yes. Um, even, even before, before this. this right. right, exactly. Even before this, just because it seemed like such a cool place. And so now that they have this, it's definitely on, it's definitely on the have-to-go list. And so hopefully we can make the trick uh, the trek there soon and see what has been done. So uh, thank you again, Martin, for chiming in. We hope that you will also visit the Strong Museum of Play. Check out the new Level Up exhibit and the huge oversized Donkey Kong cabinet there very soon. Thank you, Martin, for all of that. And we look forward to seeing you guys there soon. So, okay. Is that Good. it? Yeah. Okay. 
So, uh, again, I don't know if anybody has that. We've got it. I'll throw it back up here one more time so you guys can Mm -hmm. see it because I think it's cool. So, I mean, just, I mean, it's just a a really neat setup. I I can't imagine how hard it was to apply that side art, Tim. You think they used the the, the Uh, the the Windex method? method? I don't know. (laughs) Probably had to get some real window washers on a scaffold up there. Yeah, exactly. We need to find out those details. So, Martin, you can, um, if you got any pictures of that, I would love to see that. YouTube Fun says the change machine is two stories tall. So, (laughs) you gotta have have a change machine for it, too, I guess. But um, really just cool stuff, guys. I'm kind of scared of that speaker, man. That thing may blow you out oh, right great. there. Oh, <laughs> Lee, yeah. I mean... You're talking, you're, I mean, you're talking about like the, the largest guitar amp you've probably ever seen. But uh, anyway, good stuff there, guys. We hope that you will visit and check it out. Now, Tim, the last thing is something that we also teased up front, and that's at Christmas time we mentioned that you got the Arcade One Up NFL Blitz Legends cabinet. Yeah. As your as a Christmas present. Yeah, my wife said that I said she couldn't decide what to get me. I said I really like this. It's a good deal. She said, "Well, go ahead and buy it." So that was this was my Christmas present that has set in the shop now for almost six months yes it has been in a box and so um tim you know we we're talking about getting together over memorial day weekend and he said well i still have the nfl blitz in a box i'm like well let's get together and let's put this thing together and so we did that i went over there i guess it was sunday afternoon mm-hmm. and we put this thing together and so uh tim i wanted i have a picture that you sent me of it but i also want to talk about some of our thoughts here now you got the um the kit with the stool yeah. Okay, and it was a three hundred dollars. Right, exactly. It was three hundred dollars from Sam's Club for the whole thing, which I think mm-hmm. was a fantastic deal. Um, we finally got around to assembling it this past Memorial Day weekend. So let's give some of our thoughts on this real quick, Tim. So uh, assembly difficulty and time. So Tim, uh, what did you think overall of the difficulty of assembling it and the amount of time that it took? Well, the fact that there you had have put together plenty, and I've already put together one, and there were two of us. Sure. Made a lot of difference. It took about two hours. Yep. That's for everything. Now, that's the cabinet, the riser, and the stool. We right. did everything. Everything. But if I would have been doing that by myself, that would have taken me about four or five hours, I think. It would have probably got a little frustrating. Uh, you definitely, there were times when we needed two people to hold and to put stuff together. It was a little bit more difficult than, say, putting a Pac-Man or one of their other games together because there are a lot of parts to it. But the control panel all came together. Right. And so, I don't know. Um, and then it had the two coin doors, yep. or the fake faux coin doors. Um, and then it had the marquee light up there, so it lights up. Um, overall, I mean, I don't. I think the difficulty level, level wasn't, um, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most difficult. We're still in that 6, 7 range. It wasn't super difficult. You follow the instructions. Instructions were very good, yeah, I, I thought. thought so. and, and there were times when we needed it. There were times when we just didn't need it, and there were plenty of parts. There was some little, a little bag of extra parts which we needed to get into because we yep. lost a screw or a wood dowel or something. Um, I thought it was um, pretty pretty good. I just it would have been a tough one by myself. I think. So there was an extra step in this one that I had not seen in some of the other cabinets. There was a panel um, that had all of the signatures, uh, yeah. signatures of several NFL players on it that actually attached to the bottom part of the main cabinet. Not the riser, but the bottom part of the main. And it gave it about an extra six inches of height, something like that. Yeah, maybe. Four, yeah. four to six four inches. Four to six inches of height. And so, like, I had not seen that piece on any other cabinet. And the first time we installed those pieces, we actually installed them wrong because um, you had to line the grooves up on the side, which I did not realize. And mm-hmm. so they didn't really mention that in the instructions very well i didn't think like where we saw it but i've never seen a cabinet with that extra piece on it either with those two extra pieces on the bottom so that was new to me um but tim it didn't make the cabinet a little bit taller so let's talk about the size real quick what did you think about the size of the cabinet the design of the cabinet yeah so when once we put the riser on it feels like you're almost playing a regular it's that height of a regular rtk game i felt it almost, and I wonder if they did not put that extra on there just for that reason. Sure. That's exactly what it felt like. It felt like we we're playing, I forgot we we're playing a one up with the riser and that extension on there. Yeah. So that was a big plus to me. Um, it's not quite as wide, a little bit, you know, we're, and I wish that player one and player two were way over here or something because we were both playing on one side. 
playing four people with that would be a little tough. Agreed. And um, I think for some reason Blitz was worse because like I have the Simpsons one and an NBA Jam one and I feel like those, I don't know why the controls feel roomier on those than what they felt on the buttons, Blitz. Maybe, maybe, well, no. something, maybe it was something with that, but it feels like the Blitz is a little bit tighter. I wish they'd give you the option to, like you said, if you could play on opposite side of the cabinets but still play together. Right. Blitz is set up to where the players on the left play together and the players on the right play together, but it'd be nice if they just had a selector where it's like when you, um, you know, when you hit the start button, you can pick which player you want to be, like yeah. what, what slot you want to use. And so, unfortunately, they don't have that. So that meant me and Tim squeezing in on the left side of the cabinet in order to play together. Yeah, so felt a little tight, not not uncomfortable, but a little bit. Yeah, not like the real game. The artwork on the control panel was beautiful. I thought the sides were beautiful. Mm. The signatures with the um, with uh, had like Jerry Rice's signature yeah. and a couple other players from that nice era. Touch. But yeah, it was just a little bit different. Yeah, so I mean, there were some really nice things about it there. I like the marquee really lights up. It's LED lights back there. Yes, absolutely. Makes it feel more like an arcade game. Yeah. So um, overall, I thought the design was good. I thought the extra height, like Tim mentioned, made it a little bit taller, really kind of added to it because I would have felt without that it may have been a little short. But overall, I thought the size, design, and artwork was good as well. Um, quality of the controls. What did you think about the joysticks, buttons, all that kind of stuff? I thought they were fine. Yeah. I didn't really, when we're playing Blitz, I felt like I was playing Blitz. I Agreed. didn't really notice the difference. Yeah. Uh, and let's talk about gameplay then. So the one thing about the controls is that those screw-on joystick tops for some reason, when they I get play, a loose, they yeah. get loose, and so um, you know, Tim, I probably need to. The best thing to do would be probably do thread tape on those. I thought about that. Yeah, thread tape would probably be best. So that way, I wouldn't recommend glue or anything because you may need to take yeah. those off the control panel at some point. Another thing that I didn't do was you could take a pair of locking pliers and lock the shaft sure. and then turn it. Right. I just turned it down. I didn't really take a lot of time. It, it spins on you after a while. If you could keep that from spinning, though, you could probably get a lot tighter. Agreed. Buttons, though, felt good. I yeah, didn't feel any like... squishiness or anything. Felt responsive for the most part. No problems. Mm -hmm. So, overall, great there. Now, gameplay, Tim. The big thing, the big deal that was made was that the game doesn't have any late hits. So, did you notice that? Was that a big deal factor you? know, for you? and I like to do that on the yeah, regular Blitz. It kind of lunges at them. It just doesn't hit them. It, you kind of get a little extra second or two to jump around or something, but it, it does it take away a little bit? Yes. Does it really matter? We were having a lot of fun. No, not yeah. really. For the most part, I didn't. I mean, if you wouldn't have told me they weren't, they were there, I wouldn't have noticed. Right. So for people who are just now playing Blitz and maybe never not played as much Blitz as me and Tim have, we still had fun. We played an entire game, and Tim, it felt like Blitz. It fit. Felt Even without the late hits. Felt like blitz. It it really did. Yeah, probably the closest that same, I. I mean, yeah, same. It was out of same all plays. I was gonna say everything. out of all the one ups I played, this one felt the closest to an arcade game because of the height. Maybe. Agreed. Yeah, that's I think, probably I think what that's I would correct. say. The only thing, the crowding around the control panel is an issue. Trying to get four grown men around that thing is would be tough. Yeah, but that's I can't. Downside. But I can't wait to have my nephews over and just oh, let yeah. them play it. Yeah. it'll be fun. So stuff like that would be good. So overall, Tim, uh, what would you rate this as far as uh, you know, just quality? Um, you pay, you pay three hundred dollars. Do you feel like you got your money? Oh yeah, I definitely. It was definitely worth three hundred dollars. The screen, the, uh, the and everything. Screen was, was bright. Really I didn't really good. Screen. Yeah, screen was good. It was fantastic. I would say if there was a if scale one to ten, ten being a perfect game, I'm, I'm about an eight. I yeah. mean, it's good. Yeah. It's fun. And I can't find a Blitz anymore, so this is what I'm going to play. Yeah, agreed. I mean, mm -hmm. Blitzes are expensive now. Have you yeah. noticed I like to get a dedicated one? Um, Tim, I have the Blitz 2000 over there. Obviously, yeah. we played a lot of Blitz, okay? Yeah. And I can tell you... One of you, our favorite games. Yeah, it's one of our favorite games. And so playing it, I didn't really feel like I was playing anything different. So, no. I mean, not, I like it, Blitz. Was it the same? No. Was it very, so noticeable I wasn't having a good time or I just didn't enjoy it? Which has happened on a couple of arcade yeah, one-up cabinets. Yeah. I'm like... Eh, it ain't the same. Right. Yeah, it's okay. You know, let somebody else have it. Right. This I, this I enjoy playing, and I played a little bit by myself. The stool is just right for sitting down and playing. Um, so I like it. And, and sometimes I'm just out in the shop. I just turn it on, just let it play and listen to Dude, it. Do it's a track mode and, and all uh, stuff. Also, we didn't mention that we did connect to my internet and stuff. We did. So, Next time, if update, anybody so we, wants to play, we're we're up for a game anytime. I, think, yeah. <laughs> so, I think that's cool, and right. I can't do that on the regular blitz. So right. uh, there's some definitely for the price, you can't beat it. It was good, good, good decision. I'm glad I bought it. Yeah, it was fun. I'll come back over and play some more. Yeah, my blitz needs. I need to install the flash kit on it. My hard drive's starting to go, uh, and so I haven't I haven't even played it. In a good long video, time. maybe. Yeah, we'll exactly. Do it. I have the kit. I just need to put it on there. So anyway, good stuff, guys. So I, again, the NFL blitz arcade one up. Thumbs up from me and Tim. Yeah. For sure.
So, um, let's go ahead and check with the live chat. We're starting to wrap things up here on the regular part of the live show, Tim. But I do want to check in with the live chat real quick. Um, let's see. Joe says, if Tim doesn't stand on the top of the big Donkey Kong and throw barrels, I'm not interested. So, uh, there you go, Tim. You need to be up there throwing the barrels at people, apparently. Uh, let's see. YouTube Punk says three hundred dollars sounds fair, and yeah. th that's probably the sweet spot right there. Yeah. Now, if I'd have spent seven or eight hundred dollars for it, I don't know that I, I felt the was same. Six. But yeah. So I mean, you got it was a price. good deal. Yeah, exactly. You got for, and I remember I was thinking about pulling the trigger on it. And I was telling Tim you should pull the trigger on it definitely because I mean it just seems right. like a really great price. So um, now, Tim, we have Weez thirty four here. Now we we covered your questions earlier in the show here, Weez. So the House of the Dead four that you had in the Silence Scope two, we actually cover those earlier in the show so we want you to go back and watch that um he got the sound scope 2 to work by resetting the factory defaults him okay says. good so that's good. good um the house of the dead 4 it says output and uh output and doesn't recognize either gun okay so again we covered that in earlier in the episode definitely want to check out the manual go into the test menu and see if you can see if you can figure out what's going on with those guns if they're not showing up at all you do want to check the connectors all the way through to the arcade board and make sure they're working but we cover a lot of troubleshooting steps back earlier in the, this video so make sure you rewind it a bit and you'll get that um let's see he says does soundscope 2 have a real-time clock issues i think it does i think the clock does have to be in sync and so do make sure that um if it's not in sync if it's not holding its settings i think you need to replace the battery on that we talked about that earlier about another issue mm -hmm. um but i do think it needs to have the clock working in a lot of cases in order for it to work properly i've heard that before so um let's see um, he says he says that his soundscope two had multiple issues. LEDs were wired wrong. Gun triggers work. Grenades work in service menu. Um, let's see. But in gameplay, no tracking does not fire bullets. Fuses were also blown. Change fuses. Lastly, someone took CRT out and put in a 19-inch VGA. Uh, so there you go. So um, yeah. So I mean, all of that stuff. I mean, um, with House of the Dead, I think those guns are not. They're not um, traditional light guns. I believe right. that they are potentiometer tracking. Based. Yeah, well, no, they're not even potentiometer based. I think they're tracking guns, like what you okay. have with um, some of the newer Sega games, to where okay. almost like Wii controllers. You yes. know what I'm saying? They're kind of like that. Yes, potentiometer based in the fact that it's got probably potentiometer, in but the... it's also got a sensor up there as well. And so. Um, there may be a sensor bar up there or something. The sensor may not be working. I think I covered that in the manual for the it, for House of the Dead specifically. In the manual, it talks about that sensor bar a little if bit. If so, you can take a cell phone and show, and look up in there and see if those sensor lights are all lit and gotcha. working. They also have to be lined up or they won't work sometimes. Right, exactly. So there may be some stuff you need to check there as well. So, um, But the manual has a lot of troubleshooting settings for that. Highly recommend you check that out. Um, Current Phonograph just donated $10. Thank you so much. That Thank is you. awesome. Man, you're awesome, Current Phonograph. We're so glad to have you here. We're so glad that you're able to be here tonight and enjoy the live show. And thank you so much for the donation. Um, we, you know, we love when you guys, um, you know, donate to us, obviously. It just means that we can put that money towards um, basically feeding me and Tim at live shows. So <laughs> that's where all of our money goes is, is eating. So We also um, had, we got a new camera. How, how's the quality been tonight, guys? Just I, I wanted to ask that. Um, I know I probably look better in low def yeah. than I do in high def. There's certain people that just don't look great in high def. I'm one of them. But um, I, I've, it seems like it's playing faster and that um, there's not as much loop or whatever you say, yeah, delay. I think, yeah, I think so. And things like that. Yeah, so, so hopefully it's been a, a good, a good uh, you know, a good show. Hopefully the quality has been good on the video. Like I said, trying the 1080p out just to see how it works. So yeah. hopefully it's working well. Uh, let's see. Joe says, thanks, guys. This show is the best. Got to put in a few hours at work. So there you go. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. I think we're all caught up. All right. Okay. So let's go ahead and close up the show a little bit here. This is a reminder, guys. We always want your arcade-related videos. So if you want some free advertising for your YouTube channel, we're always looking for people to submit short videos, 10 minutes or less, about arcade-related topics. Um, send us a link to your video at questions at arcaderepairtips.com, and our staff will review it. If we like it, we will use it during one of our live show episodes. Make sure you put in a plug, in for, your, plug for your channel so people know where to find you. We look forward to seeing your submissions. Now, Tim, uh, we always put this out there because we know that there are a lot of YouTube channels, especially arcade-related ones, that may be just on the verge of monetization. And so if you are in that group, or if you're maybe you're not an arcade channel, maybe you're a, just a general channel that has some arcade videos that's fine too but if you're arcade related or you have arcade related videos we'd love to plug your channel hopefully we can help you get over that hump for monetization because that is a hump that is hard to get over sometimes for sure so uh tim it looks like all all uh, all the people in the live chat are positive about the 1080p 
So okay. There you go. YouTube Punk says now in 1080p HD. <laughs> right. Uh, Paul says looking good. So there okay, you go. good. Thank you guys. So, I, you know, you don't always see, and I certainly don't want to watch myself later. But uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and, and uh, wrap it up with the contact information. Guys, remember our general email, questions at arcaderepairtips.com, questions at arcaderepairtips.com. This is the primary way to get a hold of us is questions at arcaderepairtips.com. If you uh, send an email, if you put live show on the subject, you'll get it mentioned on the show. Otherwise, we'll get around to answering it whenever we get a chance. But again, the main email address here is questions at arcaderepairtips.com. We also have our YouTube page at youtube.arcaderepairtips.com. Of course, those of you who are watching live know where our YouTube channel is, but for those of you guys who may be listening on the audio-only version of the podcast, you can find this episode along with all the other live show videos at youtube.arcaderepairtips.com. And we do try to cover comments from the last live show on the next episode, just like we covered Wee's 34's questions tonight. He, he left comments on the last live show. His got answered earlier tonight. So if you do mm-hmm. leave comments from the last live show, we will try to cover those on the next episode. Again, youtube.arcaderepairtips.com. Tim, it's also important to mention that the audio-only version po- of the podcast does not have the after show. So if you want the after show, you will need to go to our YouTube page at youtube.arcaderepairtips.com, look up this episode, 76, and then fast forward to the after show part if you want to see that. And then we have our podcast feed, which includes our live show episodes, interviews, question and answer podcast, etc. And you guys can subscribe to it at itunes.arcaderepairtips.com for our iTunes page. We have our Spotify page at spotify.arcaderepairtips.com and our Stitcher radio page at stitcher.arcaderepairtips.com. Or you can pretty much search Arcade Repair on any podcast aggregator and find us. We will be there. But we would appreciate it that if you haven't already, go to our iTunes page at itunes.arcaderepairtips.com. And if you like what we're doing, leave us a five-star review there. That'll make sure that we get more exposure on iTunes, which is important for us. It uh, gets us more audience and all that good stuff. So thank you guys uh, who have already done that. If you haven't done that yet, please do that at itunes.arcaderepairtips.com. And then we have our social media pages, and we want to thank Mark for all of his contributions to those. He always is really good about posting the pinball stuff. He gave us the heads up on the Godzilla topper before mm-hmm. I got the PR release from Stern, so thank you for that, Mark. But you guys can uh, find our social media pages at facebook.arcaderepairtips.com for our Facebook page or at twitter.arcaderepairtips.com for our Twitter feed. So um, now, Tim, I think I figured out a way to keep those in sync again without spending too much money. But I'm having some problems working out some of the testing on it. So hopefully we'll get that working again. So I'm not double posting everything to each of those. But um, we are on Facebook and Twitter. We are not on Blue Sky or or Mastodon or any of the others yet. Um, If Twitter ever falls down, we probably will move to one of those. But for now, we're still on Twitter at twitter.arcaderepairtips.com and on Facebook at facebook.arcaderepairtips.com. So, Tim, uh, this is where we wrap up our regular part of the show. For those of you guys who may be watching for the first time, we do have an after show that occurs about five to ten minutes after the regular live show. Now, the after show is basically just me and Tim talking about whatever we want to talk about. It's me and him catching up on things we haven't talked about over the last month. Right. And so we talk arcade, but we also talk TV shows, movies, sports, uh, fi- uh, financial stuff like um, like uh, stocks, stocks and things. <laughs> and so it's really kind of a catch-all for whatever we want to talk about. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, you can tune in during the after show, which we're going to have about five to ten minutes after the live show. If you're watching this live, you wait five to ten minutes, we'll come on. Or if you're watching this after the fact, you may be able to just hit the chapter button to jump to the next chapter where the after show will start. Which is, I start putting chapters on the videos. I hope you guys appreciate that. Mm-hmm. So you can jump to just your question. Boom, it's there, right? So uh, hopefully that's the case. But Tim, what are we going to be talking about in the after show tonight? Well, we like to talk about shows we're watching. It seems like I was able to send you more that I've been watching. And even I'll I'll mention one that I haven't. I just kind of binge watched over Memorial Day weekend. Um, uh, Guys know that I've been back into sports card collecting and I bought three packs tonight. Yeah, so for those of you guys who haven't been watching the after show, (laughs) we have been... Tim has unopened packs of cards from the 80s and the 90s. Right. And we have, been, <laughs> we have been randomly opening these on the after show. So tonight, Tim, let's go ahead and tease what you brought so let's everybody see. knows. We got. You want to show them here? So tonight I thought it's kind of that season where um, baseball's in full swing. Yep. Uh, basketball's wrapping up. Yep. But we're also, NFL drafts already happened, mini camp. So it's kind of a... Good time for all three sports. So I think we have a 92 uh, baseball upper, upper deck. deck. Okay. Uh, no gum in there, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so think... uh, hang on, you got to explain that. <laughs> on the last after show, YouTube Punk paid Tim $5 to eat the gum that was in a Tops pack from 1980. Yes. 
and he ate it. Um, it's and now twenty five dollars. <laughs> I would never do that for five more dollars. But so, it was fun at the time. Yeah. Thank so you, I still fun. haven't given you the five dollars. I'll give you that oh, after okay. the show. But yes, he did eat gum from one of these packs. So in case you're wondering about that, and it was crunchy, right? It was quite crunchy. It never got chewy. That was the problem with it. Right. It wasn't, and it didn't taste too bad at first. But it definitely never got it never got great, and right. it it would never gum up. It was just like it just kept breaking down into tinier little hard pieces. It was like eating hard candy after that. Yeah. And it did not taste super good. Kind of like something that, you know, your grandma's cookies that have been in that cookie jar for a long time. And everybody knows not to eat them, but you play tricks on your friend. Hey, my grandma's got some cookies over there. That that was that one. <laughs> so a 92 uh, up 92 baseball. baseball uh, 1990 uh, Fleer football. And what I'm pretty excited to, to offer up or look into tonight, a 1990 Fleer basketball. So I'm kind of really curious. Maybe we'll find a Jordan or something in there tonight and make our night, whatever. Uh, it'll still be fun. So stick around for that. Uh, we're going to talk about some sports and a few other things. And who knows what else, whatever else you want to talk about. You might want to talk more about games. You might just want to talk about something else. Uh, we steer clear from politics for most of the time, but you never know. Some some stuff just pops up or we'll have a, a, a topic or two or just whatever's going on in the world. Talk about my next trip coming uh, up. I can talk about the fact that I booked somebody for a concert. Yes, I think that'd be a great thing to talk about. Yeah, so we can talk about uh, that, that a little bit. Jonathan's adding concert promoter to his resume. Who knew? Uh, so, <laughs> But we thank you guys for, for watching. If this is where you get off, or, I know we already have one that said he had to go. Yeah, let's, learn, let's wrap up the live chat real quick here, Tim. So, um, Paul, let's see. Steven says, I'll see you guys later. Thanks for being here, Steven. We're glad you were here. Big D Retro says, everything has been smooth for all of us. Love the channel. Thank you, Big D Retro, and thank you for being thank here. You. We appreciate that. Uh, let's see what we have. Paul says, it took me a whole show to fix the color problem on my Sanyo EZ14, but got it done before you guys went off the air. <laughs> Congratulations that's, to Paul. That's a, that's quite an accomplishment. We like to hear it. And Real Hammer Billy Lee says, got to go. Take care, guys. Thank you for being here, Real ha uh, the Real Hammer Billy Lee. We're so glad that you guys could be here tonight. Like well, Tim said, if this is your off-ramp, we're glad you were here for us. We appreciate you guys being here. You guys make the show. The live chat was so great tonight, Tim. Just yeah. an applause to all you yeah, guys. Really. You guys are awesome. Uh, we love it when you guys are here live. Even when you guys are just watching after the fact, we love it. We love you guys. Um, we, you know, we wouldn't do what we do without you. So that's what it comes down to. So thank you guys for watching and being a part of this tonight. Tim, you have anything else before we wrap up? No, just, um, you know, it, it is halfway through the year. We're looking forward to the rest of the year. Uh, looking forward to hearing you guys, your success stories. Uh, make sure and follow up with us. If you fix some stuff, uh, sometimes I, I love to hear those follow-up questions. Uh, like Greg was here tonight and he was able to tell us, yes, he just was really stuck. And so, you know. And Wee 34 got his science scope working. A lot of, that? Yeah, a lot of times it's, we're guessing, but, you know, you're the one that's putting in the work. You're the one that's out there in the on the front line. So we, we need to know. Uh, what in it, and I could have been total off base at sometimes. Let me know what did fix it. Let me know what you did come up with. Maybe that'll help the next person, and that's our goal. Absolutely. So again, guys, if this is your off ramp, we want to thank you guys for joining us. We would love for you to stay around for the for the after show, but if not, we totally understand. We will see you in July for our next live show. Remember, first Thursday night of every month at 5:30 p.m. Central Time. Be here. We'll see you then. And remember, here at Arcade Repair Tips, when you fix the game, you play the game. Take care, everybody. We'll see you soon. In 1080p. <laughs>you for watching this episode of the arcade repair tips live show all of our past episodes are available on our website at arcaderepairtips.com or on our youtube page this show is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only please consult a professional before attempting to repair any coin operated machines yourself the preceding program is a varcade entertainment production
And we're back for the after show of episode 76. Tim, yeah. how did the live show go for you? I thought really well, but I think you're, and you're not just saying that. I think what really made it was the chat was really active tonight. You guys not only asked questions, it was some of the questions that we were covering. And it's always good to have guys like Paul also throwing in those extra uh, things that, you know, he adds to it. So thank you for all, all of you for being part of the community. I love hearing where everybody was from and uh, just, you know, you know, that really made the show to me. And I thought we had some good questions tonight that were um, some were some were very, very needed questions. Like I, I could see how uh, some people would struggle with a few of those things. And I hope that they get their games fixed. But it felt like it felt good. Agreed. Now we didn't mention during the show, Tim, that you're wearing the Seven Eleven shirt. I found That's one right. in your size, so, <laughs> yeah. um, which is good. And it, I tell you, these shirts are nice. I liked mine a lot. They kept running out everywhere I would go, and Jonathan found one and picked it up for me. There so. you go. And I, I tell you, it's comfy. It's nice. If you guys haven't picked them up, pick them up now because I think they're going to be gone. What in July or August? One or the other. Most most are kind of phasing out right now. I know I got some stickers and some other stuff now. I'm not seeing hardly anything at all. Yeah. So a lot of people have went through their stock. But if you got 7-Eleven near you, uh, what's he saying in the Mr. chat? Mr. Dwayne 79 says he just got here. So. Oh, no big deal, yeah, man. You're, you're, here. you're right on time. Yeah. yeah. Now, this is the after show, so that means we have completed the regular show. So if you're waiting for us to cover a question or something like that, we've already done that. But you can um, ask a question. But you can ask a question, correct. You can still ask questions. We're still here for that. But we will be covering a variety of topics here in the after show, including what we did on Memorial Day, what summer plans we have. Uh, we'll be talking about some investment stuff, because we always like to do that. We'll also be talking about some sports and um, TV shows, movies that we've been watching, along with some other stuff. So, Tim, how did your May go? So, we know that you went to Amarillo. Yes, that was um, the, kind of the trip of the month. Of, for a week, I was in Amarillo, and it went good. I like Amarillo... Um, one thing we didn't talk about was the before I went to the arcade, I went to the Big Texan. And if you guys aren't familiar with the Big Texan, maybe you've seen the show Man vs. Food, or maybe you're you're have uh, heard of it before. It's kind of famous uh, Texas Steakhouse. They have is it 72 ounce steak? Ooh. It looks like a roast. Uh, it doesn't really look much like a steak. It's thick and looks like a roast. Uh, a side of shrimp cocktail, a salad, a drink, and uh, something else. You got to eat it all. If you can eat every bit of that and within one hour, it's free. And so they have a platform up there with a table with six chairs, and it's fun to watch people attempt to eat it. I saw a guy, I thought this guy's going to do it. He's just constantly eating, and he was nailing it, and he would eat all this. and. He was just going really fast. I thought, this guy's going to do it. And then I went over with about a minute left to look, and it looked like he had a 20-ounce steak on his oh plate. Oh, my goodness. Still go. He's, he's like, I could do it. I just can't do it in the time. Right. And I, I don't know. I've, I've never attempted anything like that. While he was enjoying his 72-ounce, uh, I had about a 20-ounce. I was knocking on that one pretty hard. It was filling me up. Um, so it's really famous. Um, they had the Man vs. Food guys been there. They had, um, Will Ferrell had been there, and they had a little video clip you could uh, download off, off on your phone and watch it. Uh, what I also, we, I mentioned this to you, uh, John, is the music group Foghart, which had the... Foghat, hit, right? Foghat, I'm sorry, I said Foghart. Foghat, who had the music, uh, the song Slow Ride yeah. uh, back in the 70s, and... Uh, they were actually playing, I think it's one band, band member, maybe. Yeah, I was about or, to say, how many are original? I don't know, <laughs> but uh, they were playing a concert there, so they have a concert place, a lot of big souvenir shop. They have just a lot of fun. It's really fun if you take the kids. There was a lot of stuff for kids to do. They have a shooting gallery. They have pictures you can take with a huge rocking chair, bigger than bigger, uh, me and John could both sit in it with plenty of room. All texas side stuff. So... Amarillo is kind of that. It's it's a cattle town, a lot of good steakhouses, and I like to eat. Had some really good barbecue while I was there. Uh, just a good trip over overall. Uh, what about you, John? Is it so um, May went well. We had, um, of course, we had a lot going on with the end of school. That was probably the biggest thing. Um, so we did that. I was trying to think of what else kind of we did in May. Um, you know, end of school probably took out most of it. My daughter 
and my son both play soccer, and so every Saturday uh. I was out there on the soccer <laughs> field basically watching, you know, uh, we get out there at 8.30, we leave about noon, so it basically took up all morning uh, every Saturday, so that's what I did for most of my Saturdays in May, which was fine, and we had a good time doing that. And, um, you know, of course, Memorial Day, I got together with Tim. We built the Blitz for part of that, but I also just kind of hung out, worked on some different things here and there. Um, nothing real big. Uh, you know, Monday, um, this past Monday for Memorial Day, went over to my parents' house, just kind of hung yeah. out. Uh, we have one of those big inflatable slides. I took that over there right. so the kids could play on it, my nephews and my kids, of course, and we had a good time. So um, I will talk about something I've got plans for, though, um, summer plans kind of thing. So on Saturday, we've already bought our tickets. I'm, I'm taking my oldest, my daughter, to go see the new Spider-Man okay. uh, across the Spider-Verse movie. Okay. Which, Tim, have you seen this? I have not. I haven't so, seen a preview. You haven't seen the new one? Or the, um, have you never seen um, Enter the Spider-Verse? No. Okay, you need to see this. It's okay, really good. I'll, I'll so um, they're, they're cartoons, but they're really well done. And they are kind of adult cartoons. And the first one, like, somebody dies and stuff mm-hmm. like this. Not stuff that you normally see. I mean, unless it's a mom in a Disney fil- film, usually we don't see people die in, in cartoons. Right. So it's for older kids. My daughter's 10, or about to be 10. So, I mean, she's kind of old enough to handle it at this point. My son's not going. But we're very excited about seeing Across the Spider-Verse. If you guys um, have seen the first one, then hopefully you know what I'm, you know how excited we are about it. It looks really good. So I do have plans to do that for May. And we are going to Canada probably at the end of July, beginning of August kind of thing. Not exactly sure when for sure. But we are going to Canada, and so that'll be fun, too. I've got a lot of family in Canada in the Calgary area, and so looking forward to doing that this summer. Uh, probably we'll go to one of the divisions my company has as well. So I don't know which one. We'll figure that out. They want me to go to Colorado. So oh, that'd to Colorado. be nice. So, what about you, Tim? Anywhere else you're going? Well, I'll be going to South Dakota next week. In right. fact, Sunday, and today is Thursday. Right. I'll head to Sioux Falls, South Dakota for a week. Um, uh, Paul, you might remember last year I was in Florida I'm pretty sure sometime in July I'll be in Florida. I'm not sure if I'll be in the same area, but that's where Paul and I got to meet up and hang out for just a little bit while I was there last year. It doesn't seem like it's been a year ago, but it has. Sure. Um, So every summer, uh, my company does a program for the state, and so they always ask for volunteers to go. To go down there, we need all hands on deck to go and help them to make this project go smoothly. And at the same time, it's actually kind of an easy job to do. Sure. And uh, we usually have, get off early in the afternoons. We all go to the beach or whatever. So go. I'll be headed to Florida, I hope. Uh, other than that, my son is coming in from, um, he'll be coming in from South Carolina around 4th of July. So I'm taking an extra day off there. I uh, always look forward to 4th of July. It's one of my favorite holidays. Hate that's on a Tuesday this year. Yeah, it's Makes kind it of tough. A, yeah. Take off Monday, though. I did take off Monday. That's so it. I got my four day before I hit back to work that day. So that'll be fun. Um, that's about it. I, there's always something going on. Who knows where I'll end up in August or sometime. Agreed. Um, let's see. Let's move to investment talk, Tim. Anything to talk about there? Man, very little. It's just been... Um, I have been almost to the point I don't look at it some yeah. day, most days. It's just um, we're going to have to wait. And uh, uh, there's just as long as interest rates stay this high, I'm really worried about people buying a home now. A guy was really excited the other day that he he got seven and a quarter. Oh, I know. And I was like, really? And I was like, man, I think my You realize like, like two years ago we were in the two. Yeah, right? mine's 2.75, yeah, I mine, think. Yeah, exactly. And so... Um, Bought our home at a good time, so I, I just I, I'm really apprehensive with doing much investing. Still buying some gold stocks. Um, that's about it. So I've been looking into dividend stocks pretty hard and heavy. Yeah. Because the nice thing about dividend stock is that get some kind of you return. always met, yeah you're always going to get a return because even if the stock goes down you get dividend right. Right. And so I've been looking at mainly some ETF style um, uh, ETF style uh, dividend funds, and so. You know, I think I may start putting part of my retirement account in those because my retirement account has not been doing very well, right. yield wise. Yeah. And so um, I'm thinking maybe just taking a portion of that, putting it into dividend stocks so I can get maybe a little bit of a return during this very difficult market. So, yes. um, so just something I'm looking into. I'm not going to talk about any specific ones I'm looking at. Me and my dad have been kind of talking about it. And, you know, he gives me some things to look at. So, you know, and I, I tend to listen to him. He is my dad. So, mm-hmm. and Tim knows my dad. He's kind of a smart guy. Yeah, so, um, very smart. Yeah, so hopefully uh, I may try to do that. But other than that, yeah, I'm not investing in anything either, Tim. I still have my AMC stock. 
um, which I'm holding on to so I can get that free IC coupon that I just got. <laughs> right? So I do okay. get a free IC. Uh, did you get your free IC? I have not done that yet. I okay, well, see, there you go. So if you have AMC stock, they send you coupons for freebies sometimes. I got a free IC. I will well. be using Ed Across the Spider Verse this, sun, this Saturday. So well, okay. there you go. I'm going to get my free IC. I got uh, my you know, it's, lost, it's probably lost more than an IC's worth, so I'm probably coming out of the low <laughs> on that thing. But uh, anyway. So they take all my money because, you know, I rented a movie theater last month, right? So, I mean, like, they're taking all my money. We did go see the Mario movie again. I think I mentioned that um, after that. And so this is the first movie I've seen since the Mario movie is the Cross oh. the Spider-Verse. So i um, looking forward to going back to see another movie. I really wanted to see Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and I didn't get to do no, it. I didn't get to either. So maybe at some point. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh <laughs> somebody says got your mind on your money and your money on your mind hey you know you got it all the time all the time man hey i want my money to work hard for me you know what i'm saying right tim right. we always talk about that so um let's see uh okay so anyway let's uh let us go on to some sports talk tim so mlb season's here and i'm happy to say that i'm a fan of the first place texas <laughs> rangers right. the first place texas rangers who have not relinquished the first place since the beginning of the season we have held on to first place the entire time tim yeah a, Those angels, woo! Yeah. <laughs> uh, Astros are starting to come on a little bit. It makes uh, me a little nervous, nervous, but, yeah. uh, you know. I don't know uh, what fans of which teams we have in here, but if you're a fan of a team, let us know how your team's doing. Um, Tim, if you're an Oakland fan, I'm sorry. Right. So, <laughs> uh, it'll just accelerate the move to Vegas, though. So right. that's a good way to look at it. You know, California has five baseball teams. So it's probably about time for one of them to move out. Right. One, one of the things I like to do when I travel is I'm kind of disappointed Sioux Falls doesn't have a team. You yeah. know, it's like... I they like have a minor be, league team or anything? Probably. Yeah, check out the but, minor league. But, you know, I was like, I, I like to go to new baseball fields, yeah. uh, and so maybe I'll get a chance to go to something in Florida while I know the Rays are still doing pretty good. Right, exactly. So the Rays are still the number one team in baseball right now. Yeah. Too. Now, we are a close second. I think so. Okay, but the Rays are the Rays are number one, and the Rays are really good. We get healthy. Be. We'll yeah. be all right. I mean, we got, if DeGrom comes back right. and starts pitching the way he's supposed to be pitching. Look, I've been a long-time Ranger fan, guys. I love, I love Texas Ranger baseball. And so this season makes me very happy. Mm-hmm. If you haven't seen Nathan Avaldi pitch this year, you should. <laughs> so, um, but uh, it's been good. There's a lot of good teams out there. The Orioles have been a real stunner. I had no idea the Orioles were going to be as good as they are. They're as good as we are. Yeah. And yeah. everybody, I mean, they've just got some young guys on that team, Tim, that are playing out of their minds. And these guys are good enough. They may just continue to play like that. Who knows? Well, a lot of our rookies are what's carrying our team. Yeah, so. agreed. So, I mean, it's, it's or amazing. Or young players. Right, exactly. It's amazing what the rookies that are coming up now, it's like they're more prepared than ever. So, really good stuff. Um, let's talk about NBA Finals, Tim. How do you feel about Heat Nuggets? I lost interest after that last yeah. round. I'm kind of like, eh, I don't care. What about the Celtics? I huh? probably, I thought the Celtics were going to pull yeah, everything off, awesome. and they really fell apart the last game. Oh my gosh, that. yeah. That was a disappointment, because I am a somewhat, I'm, Mavericks are my team, but Celtics have always been a close second, and, uh, that goes back to the Larry Bird days, of course, but, um. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I'll be rooting for the Nuggets probably. I yeah. just because, you know, they, I have they ever the Heat, won. I was about to say, no, I don't think they have, and he have a lot of titles at this point. So yeah, go I'm, Nuggets, go Nuggets. Yeah, um, let's talk about. Oh, we got a Reds. Mr. Dwayne says he's a Reds fan. So hey, you talk about the Reds. We've lost two series this year. Guess who one of those series was two? To the Reds. The freaking Reds. That's yeah. right. So you guys swept us in a two-game series. So I mean, you're you know you're good enough to beat us. I don't know how how that happened. I figured we. I thought that was gonna be an easy win, mm-hmm. but you guys beat us. So there you go. So the Reds may not be as bad as you think. One ballpark I would love to go to. Oh yeah, yeah. is that uh, Great American Ballpark? Yeah, I think so. So um yeah, so I would love to go to that yeah. ballpark. The only a lot other of team, history. Yeah, so it's the only other team that's beats in the series is the Atlanta Braves. And guess what, Tim? They're yeah, really good. They are really good. So um so yeah so I mean, who knew the Reds were gonna beat us? So I mean. The Reds may have more to hold on to than what you're thinking, for sure. Um, let's see. Let's talk about just a bit of NHL. Um, Vegas Golden Knights versus Florida Panthers. This is the Stanley Cup. So that's who's going to play for it. Tim, um, the a moment of morning yes. for the Dallas Stars. Oh, it was such a... What an effort, though, right? What an to effort. Bring it, what an to effort. make it go that long and to come back. and. So two. I really thought that game six, we were on a roll. We were down so. 3-0. Jamie Benn, Jamie Benn committed the most atro- atrocious of... Fouls, I think I've ever, or not, I forget what they, I mean, of um, penalties I've ever seen in my entire life. I believe it. Um, it was terrible, and he got suspended two games for it, and I thought, you know, we won those two games, though. And I'm like, going into game six, I'm like, maybe we got a chance, right. and they just stomped us. I mean, literally, yeah, the, the Vegas Golden Knights just stomped a mud hole in us. Yeah. So, uh, I am in mourning there for my Dallas team. Stars, so... 
Uh, we got you know, we got some great players, Joe Pavelski and Tyler Sagan and and golly, you know, just I mean, some really great guys, you know. And, and so I hate that um, I hate that it's come to the end. I was really looking forward to a Stanley Cup run. But so who's happen. your pick for the final? The Vegas Kevin. Golden Knights, yeah. man, they're good. Um, now the Panthers are nothing to sneeze at, but I think if Vegas is playing up to the level that they can play to, they show that in Game Six. If mm-hmm. they're playing good, you can't stop them. They, they're, they, they are the perfect kind of. We played the Minnesota Wild in the first round, and the Wild were real physical. Mm-hmm. Then we played the Seattle Kraken, and the Kraken are real fast. Vegas is a great mixture of both those things. They are very disciplined with their physicality. Okay, mm-hmm. so they do it when they need to do it. Right. But they're fast on the ice, too. And so with that in mind, I think Vegas is going to win. So Vegas Golden Knights would be where my money is. Florida Panthers, though, nothing to sneeze at. I mean, they took out some great teams, Carolina being the last one that they took out. And so, I mean, I could see Florida getting it, too. But I'm picking Vegas Golden Knights for the win. So, I mean, that's my personal prediction. Uh, don't know if it's going to happen. We'll see. Now, Tim, let's talk about a championship that's already happened. And that was the XFL championship between the Arlington Renegades and the D.C. Defenders. And, Tim, we were we were messaging each other, watching that's this right. live, and Arlington freaking pulled it out. Somehow. I don't know. One Who... of the Dallas teams got a championship, Tim. Right. We got a championship right, right there. So, uh, so, I thought the game was good. Um, man, ever since we picked up that quarterback, and I can't think of his name at the moment, our offense was on another level. Yeah, just different. And that guy made all the difference. Because we had gone through three quarterbacks that were not very good. Drew Plitt was one of them. Um, I can't remember who the other two were. But none of, none of them were good. Right. And then we picked up this guy from Seattle, like off basically the waiver wire. They right. were cutting him. We picked him up. Guy was fantastic. And it's not like he's going to be in the NFL next year. No, I think he'll he be a backup, though. But but he, he, show, he just wins. Yes. He just had a good... Uh, game management was he, good. Game it. management is a great way to say it. He was yeah. he was a he was a kind of quarterback who didn't make mistakes. Right. So I mean that's the kind of thing. It's not that he had big 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 plays. He had some. Okay, but it was more that he was disciplined and tr- didn't make many mistakes. And like I said, that's what you want in like a backup quarterback in the NFL, right? You want a guy who's gonna he he's gonna kind of dink and dunk it down the field, and he's not gonna make many mistakes right. doing that. That's and he's that kind of quarterback. He can throw it deep sometimes if he needs to. But for the most part, he was safe. And I yeah. think that's what we need was we just need a guy who's not going to throw interceptions, who's if he misses, he's going to miss big and he's not you know, he's not going to he's not going to give it to the defense. And that mm-hmm. was the biggest thing. He didn't turn over the ball much. That made all the difference. And I tell you what, when he did throw it deep, he made those plays, which was good on him. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it just made all the difference. So, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up getting a backup at least a look in the NFL Hopefully. at a backup spot. So, um, but we had several players from the XFL who have already gotten looks. Um, who have already gotten looks from the NFL. Um, yeah. They're always posting them. I got a lot of guys on the Renegades, especially on our defense, Tim. We know our defense was pretty stout this year. Mm-hmm. A lot of defensive guys from the Renegades are already getting looked at in, by NFL teams. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we see a lot of those guys cross over. So, but it was a fun season. And congratulations to Bob Stoops. Big For game sure. Bob pulled it out. Always. Because DC mm-hmm. had a way better record than we did. They we did. snuck into we snuck into the playoffs with a losing record almost. So, like, I mean, it was... Three and three? Yeah, it? or five and four or something like yeah. that. It was close. So, I mean... You know, but congratulations to the Arlington Arlington Renegades and to Big Bob Stoops coming through with the win. It was awesome. Mm. So, okay, Tim, let's move to um, I guess let's move to some current movies and TV show talk. Okay. Now you got to watch a lot of different things um, over kind of. I know your wife had been out of town, yeah. So you got a little bit of time to watch some things. So tell us what you've been watching. Um, well, let's see. Um, one thing that I really the, in the last few days, I watched uh, John Waite, The Hard Way, which yes. was a documentary about John Waite. And, um, so for those of you guys who don't know John Waite, I believe the big 80s hit, Missing You, yeah. as well as um, Bad English. Was that his band? Or what yes, was the band? Bad okay. English. Bad English was the, he was the lead singer of Bad English. Right. When I See You Smile. Yeah, right, was that big one? So um, that is John Waite. So tell us about John Waite. So what was really interesting is about... Um, how the he talks a lot about how the music industry was and how the pay went and how that they would have a number one album and this big song and owe the record company money like losing money and they couldn't even tour fast enough to make even ends yeah, meet. And that's a good point. A lot it of artists just, make money on touring, not so much on the albums, right? right. That's the record company. So and so uh, realistically it's a it's a very good documentary about him and how he just he never cared about the money. He loved. He was a true musician. It was very good at his craft. He loved a tour. 
He loved to sing in front of people. That's what he wanted to do. And uh, so it's a lot about during COVID when he couldn't do that. Oh. And it shows how it affected him mentally and everything, how we just need that. He needed that connection with us, and we needed that connection with him. And so he even did a couple uh, concerts like in his living room yeah. with and his wife was cheering him on. I watched them. And uh, how that helped a little bit, but it just wasn't the same. And so that's kind of what the documentary is about. I really had a lot of respect for him after watching that. And just how he just, he's like, I got enough money to get by on. I just want to be out there. I want to be singing and performing, writing songs and stuff like that. So Does he get any one. royalties from any of the stuff that he's written? Or you know, what's, what's weird is he kind of went off on his own. And so he has all these albums. They're just his. They're not on any record label. And what's cool about that is listening to some of those. If you like that song, Missing You, and you like some of his other songs, there's like 50 songs out there I never even heard of that sound super enough similar that I liked them. I'm gotcha. like, oh, he didn't change a lot. I was like, that's good. Right. And so um, I can't think offhand. There was one about like, it's called the um, the whole album, something about being at the bar or something. Man, I'm telling you, every song on there is like, this is... But because he didn't sign with a big record label, they didn't play him on the radio. Right. So, you know, now he does a lot online and stuff. And uh, that was really interesting. I thought it was good. Now that's on Prime Video. Hope that is on Prime out, right? Video. Also, I watched um, uh, a documentary about Reggie Jackson just called Reggie. And, um, you know, there's you don't hear much or haven't heard much from Reggie Jackson in a long time. And he speaks pretty openly about it. He's like, I'm really nervous about doing a documentary. I want to get my side. I don't want it to be twisted and turned. And they really gave him a lot of liberty. It, it doesn't, they didn't, they're asking the question, they're letting him explain. And it really explained to me a lot because I grew up when I saw Reggie Jackson hit three home runs in a World Series game. It's just like, I don't know if anybody will ever do that again. And it oh, was. Oh, I was there when it happened. It was again. just. Yeah, that was true. <laughs> so. That's true. But, but. I Albert was, Pujols, 2011 World Series, guys. Right. For those of you guys who. who Playing the Rangers, know, right? That's right exactly. <laughs> but I was just saying that it was such a big feat, but, you know, he was. A lot of people thought he was kind of a know it all, a hot, hot head, a hot dog. A lot of people didn't like him. He didn't get along with management very well. When you really hear his side of it, it's really sad. It kind of I don't think he was really a bad guy at all. I think he was a really good guy. One of the best stories in there, and I won't dwell on it too much, was he liked old cars. And he had a really cool old car, and they didn't even have good parking spaces. So he, played, he paid a guy, would you watch my car? <laughs> and when he come out there, this guy was beating the heck out of somebody. Uh, because he wanted to, uh, was messing with Reggie's car. He's like, no, that's, you know, and so he said, I'm going to take this guy out for a burger. And they, and he says, you know, do you like baseball? And the guy's like, yeah, I love baseball. And so he's like, I tell you what, let's, how about I pick you up? And the guy kind of needed an older brother type and become friends with him. And he says, man, you got a really good arm for a guy. And it was Dave Stewart. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And uh, so it was like he really was a nice guy, and he did a lot of good things that people never heard about, didn't ever make the news. So if you're a baseball fan, I highly encourage you to watch the documentary Reggie. That's Prime Video too, right? Yes. Um, I, you put on there the last thing he told me. I started to watch that, and I've actually got into another show. And okay. it kind of... You ever, you ever been on one show and it was pretty good? We also got one in common, The Diplomat, I watched some of. Good. But um, I started watching this show and then I got on to something else. And honestly, I thought it was, and it kind of is a chick flick, but I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I really, really liked it. And uh, that was Firefly Lane. Okay, uh, Firefly, Firefly Lane. Lane. I've heard this before. I, I don't know what it's about. I'll tell you in a synopsis what it's about. It is about uh, two girls. One is Katherine Heigl, and the other one, I can't think of her name, but she played the second Becky on uh, Roseanne. She also played the, she was the blonde haired girl on Scrubs. Somebody in oh, the chat room can help me. I have no idea. But they play like you would really think, you forget their actors. They look like and they talk like, and it goes through how they just become best friends, and it, 
it goes back and forth from now to back when they were kids and they were both going through kind of puberty together and just bonded and and one was kind of nerdy and one was kind of hot but she just didn't like anybody and uh, you know they just bonded and how their friendship grew throughout the years having kids going through trials of life whatever stuff like that I guarantee you it probably wasn't the the most manly thing to say, I watched the whole thing by myself, but I told my wife, you should watch this with me. You would really, she would really like it, and she's been watching it now on the plane home, and she's like, it's really good. There you go. So, I like that show. Okay. Um, so, I've heard good things about it, and you see, look, Tim, uh, I can say this, I have watched all of the complete Gilmore Girls, Tim. Okay. I, I, am, I like Gilmore Girls. It was really good. And... Um, Let's talk about the one we had in common before we get to anything okay. else, and that's The Diplomat. Yes. So, um, what did you think before I go on? I think I told you to watch it, right? Yeah, I haven't watched, but I think five or six episodes so You're far. On, I mean, there's not many. There's only like eight. Okay, yeah, so I'm not very... I mean, I'm pretty far along, but not... haven't finished, and I really liked it so far. I think it's good. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's really good. So, The Diplomat has... Um, oh, what's her name from the Americans? I can't think of her name at the moment. Uh, and she was in uh, the, the other show on the WB and stuff like that. Ah, oh, golly, I should know this. <laughs> um, but it's... Um, I'll tell you. Russell. Carrie Russell. Carrie Look Russell. at that. It's, right. it. it's got Carrie Russell in it, and she plays this diplomat, but like a real diplomat that, you know, it was station to go to the Middle East and she's right. been working in like these Middle Eastern countries and stuff well she gets rec recruited to go to England right. which is like a totally different a letdown station. for her right a big letdown because she's used to like negotiating peace between like you know Middle Eastern countries and the United States and stuff yeah. like that so, I mean like I mean like doing serious diplomatic work right and she gets kind of tossed to this kind of um ceremonial position in a way yeah and, but it turns out there's a reason for that, and I don't want to spoil the reason. Tim right. probably knows because he's watched that far in. Mm -hmm. But um, it's kind of her transitioning and really not knowing how to handle this new position. But her husband has tons of experience at this because right. he has <laughs> been doing this kind of thing all the time. And so there's this dichotomy between her and her husband and like him taking over uh, some of the things that she really needs to be doing. And then there's her interacting with like the, the English, you know, the English leadership and of stuff her. like that. Yeah. Her counterpart plus the um, prime minister there and kind of all of this kind of stuff. And then her interacting even with her staff yes. is weird because she's not used to having all these people doing yeah. all this stuff in she this has no she does no interest in politics no she doesn't want to be anything and then but she's thrown in this she role. wants to be working like yeah, i said like, towards on peace the field. in the middle yeah. east like be in the battle with all the people and they put her into the ceremonial role that she really has no interest in but it is fantastic the acting is great the writing is fantastic it's already been um green lit for a second season i can see why highly yeah. recommend the diplomat so, now I watched something on Netflix that you watched last okay. time, and that's The Night Agent. Right. So, The Night Agent, um, it was okay. Um, the story was great. Yeah. I will give you that. story's really good. Writing is really good. The acting was... was a sub, little subpar. Yeah, the acting was rough. Um, and so, I got about three episodes in, and I took a big break. And uh -huh. I was like, I don't know if I'm even going to finish it. Cause, but I'm glad I did, because the story does get better. It does. And overall, I did like it. I think it has been set up for a second season. Yes. But um, I don't I don't know if I'm in for a second season. It was fine. Um, it was fine. But there's the problem is, is there's so much good stuff to watch that it, it wasn't as good as the other good stuff to watch. Right. That, I mean, it, there was nothing against it. It's just there's a lot of good stuff. Um, we finished up season two of Perry Mason, Tim. Nice. Um, with... Carrie Russell's husband, um, <laughs> Matthew Reese, and yeah. so um, it was really good. Um, it was better than the first season. Their family's just banking right now. Oh, I'm they? telling you. Have you seen Cocaine Bear? They're both yes, in that. Both of them. Uh, I was about to say. Um, so Perry Mason's second season was better than the first. Enjoyed okay. it. Loved the ending. Thought it, it went well. I love how they left it. I thought they left it really well. It's on HBO Max now. Max no longer HBO, but. Right. Um, but highly recommend Perry Mason season one and two. You should watch it. Love Matthew Reese. I've talked about that when we talked about Cocaine Bear, Tim. Love Matthew Reese. Awesome. Uh, and he does great as Let me say something before I forget it. Sure. I started last night. You remember you told me about the show Candy. Yes. Did you know there is a the one, one on, on Max? Max. Yes. Yeah, it's called Life and Death. I tried to watch this. I watched like 30 minutes and I fell asleep. So but, I haven't got. But we've it. already seen it. So kind it's kind of like. But... It, but it's it different. is the same show, and right. it's a little different take on it. And I, I enjoyed it. I, I want to watch it. an episode last night. Yeah, I'm going to get through it. I'm going to get through it. So, um, The Mandalorian season three finished up. I really liked it. 
fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Mandalorian is good. I know that this season people were griping because it didn't really focus in as much on Din Djarin, who is the main Mandalorian character. Mm. It kind of it kind of had a couple of kind of side things. Um, so, um, but I enjoyed the side things. That was my thing, and I, I like that Din Djarin was in it. We still got to see him a lot, but we kind of had a side story about kind of bringing the Mandalorian factions together, which I thought was really good. So um, I enjoyed it. It just depends. If you, you want to see just more action with Din Djarin, you may not have enjoyed it as much, but I thought it was good. Um, the Marvelous Miss Maisel, uh, which is on Prime Video. Tim, have you watched? I have never seen it. Oh. I've watched. I've seen, like, I scroll through it every time. So you like Firefly Lane. you got to I'm going to have to watch it, yeah. I think of my... I think this is the final season. The last okay. episode is over. Me and my wife are catching up. We're about five episodes, four episodes behind. Golly, it's good. And, you know, I mean, it's written by Amy Sherman Palladino and her husband, who are the same people who wrote Gilmore Girls, Tim. Mm-hmm. But I feel like Maisel is actually better. I like it better. You know what it's about, right? A, a girl comic in, like, the 19, yes. 1950s. Yes. So, 60s time frame. And it's good. You should watch the entire thing. Loving the last season. Well, I'll, I would say this about Firefly Lane. It is sad. It starts off, you know, here, here's the synopsis of the show. They've been friends for 30 years, but something happens. Right. And, and so you're wondering what happened that caused this awesome friendship to break. And that's what it leads, it leads up to. Gotcha. So with Mizell, the final season, what we're getting is this really cool, um, this really cool effect where the beginning of every episode flashes forward to the future. Oh. And then then they show you something in the future and they come back and now and then bring you back into kind of like what we consider up to that. that current time. Right. Yeah. And so you kind of get to see these flash forwards and flashbacks of everything. And it is brilliantly done. Oh my goodness. Good job on the flash on the flash forwards and the flashbacks. Golly, that is that is really well done. That's exactly that's hard right. to do. Yeah. It's hard to do well. This show does it fantastic. So highly recommend. And then, Tim, the one that breaks my heart the most, Ted Lasso's final episode was last night. Okay. Or actually, Tuesday night. And I know season three got a lot of flack. Um, there are a lot of, like, kind of, like, throwaway storylines and mm-hmm. stuff like this. Tim, I love this show. You know, I've heard multiple people say that this is, like, the best show they've seen and in years. the ending was, just... was great. Oh, that's good. So, I that mean. That makes a difference. And here's the thing. It may not be an ending. Right. They they kind of tease that it may be the ending, but they haven't said for sure. And here's the thing: Ted Lasso is the main character of this. Mm-hmm. You could easily see the show going Spin on off. without him. Mm-hmm. Okay, oh. and I think that's kind of maybe that's where they're going. Maybe mm-hmm. we're gonna see it named something else, you know. Um, but Ted Lasso was kind of the main character, but throughout the season, he repeatedly kind of stepped out of that main character role. And so, like I said, I think it's almost like they were setting up. Oh, we're going to go on without him. But mm. they haven't said anything about that yet. Don't know for sure. Yes, we'll see. And it definitely mm. wrapped up in an ending. Like, it gave us a definite ending. If the show could end here, it'd be fine. But I would like to see a spinoff without Ted. So, there you go. Apple TV, right? Apple TV for that. Yes, and the last thing he told me on Apple TV, the one that you said you guys wanted to mm-hmm. watch, my mom and dad watched it. They said it was great. And so, that is on my list to watch. And that has, um, what's her name from Alias in it? Jennifer Garner. So Now, uh, I know I watched it, but now I kind of can't remember what... I haven't seen it all. It's a movie, right? Yes. Uh, it's a it's a, it's a series? six episode show, five episode show. It's like a mini series. Mm. So, okay, let's open the cards. All right. So we are down to the. I, I I put them in kind of this order. We'll go with the football first. Okay. So for those of you guys who are just watching the after show or just 19, got here, like Mr. Dwayne, 90. we are opening three packs of cards tonight: a football, a baseball, and a basketball. This is a 1990 football Fleer, right? Yes. So Fleer pack. So we're no gonna, gum. Okay, no gum in this yeah. one. So that's good. Tim doesn't have to eat anything. All right. So we will start off. Uh, not, probably one of the most boringest. I remember this card. They, they just, there's not a lot of flash to yeah, them. Yeah, remember right? these two. All right. Well, this was a good re- wide receiver back in the day. We've got uh, Don Beeb for, uh, and this um, this is Buffalo. Yeah. Well, if you're a Buffalo fan, you definitely know who that is. Um, this guy is, was a popular uh, linebacker, uh, Clay Matthews. Clay Matthews, and he is for um, Cleveland, right? Yeah. Cleveland. Uh, Walker Lee Ashley. So there we go. And he is Kansas City, for the Chiefs fans out there. Okay, I definitely remember this name, Kevin Fagan. Yes, Ke- Kevin Fagan, of course, another San Francisco guy, 49ers. All right. Uh, John Grimsley. Don't recall that guy. John Grimsley was a Houston... Is this an Oilers? Wow, yeah, the Oilers. Houston Oilers, <laughs> Oilers card. So definitely remember this guy, one of the best, uh, Daryl Green. Yeah, Daryl Green. Of course, Washington. All right. 
And the card that's never, ever worth a dime, uh, the punter, Lee Johnson. <laughs> that's right, punters. <laughs> that's so always Cincinnati. a common. Nobody wants collects punter cards. Cincinnati Bengals. Maybe if you're a Ray Guy or something, you're yeah, pretty maybe. good. All right, so then we got uh, def- defensive back Steve Atwater. Don't there, remember yeah, him. Steve Atwater for Denver. Broncos. Uh, Martin Bayless, again. It uh, looks like a, is that uh, San Diego Chargers, right, Tim? Chargers. Yeah. yeah. The next two I kind of recognize because they were quarterbacks. Uh, Jack Trudeau. Oh, yeah, Jack the, Trudeau. Indianapolis Colts. And I remember this guy as a cowboy, but this is when he was playing for uh, that's uh, Arizona. Arizona. Uh, Gary Hogaboom. Yep. Or Phoenix. This is the Phoenix Cardinals Phoenix. at this yeah, point. Phoenix yeah, Cardinals, Phoenix right? Cardinals. That's right. So, uh, Roland James. Roland James, New England Patriots. We're still not breaking any records here. Uh, Bob Gagliano. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, Detroit right. Lions. My favorite card of the group. We'll save him for last. Eric McMillan, defensive back. For the New York Jets. And probably the only card that made this one worth it to me, although it's not worth a lot, is the Cowboys, and this is Bill Bates. Oh, Bill Bates. There we go, Dallas yeah. Cowboys. Definitely. Uh, great player there. Those there for you. So we'll go into uh, baseball next. This is 92. Was I don't know if you remember. Let's see if it says on here. 92. Um, King Griffey Jr. would be nice. Okay. This is what we're looking for, though. Find the Williams. 91 was find the Nolan. Oh, that's and, right. And uh, okay. 92, it says find the Williams. So I think there was a Ted, Ted Williams. Ted Williams, yep. So if we score a Ted Williams autograph tonight. Tim's going to jump up and down, right? Yeah. <laughs> I will probably eat this wrapper. <laughs> So this is just that fun. would be like really, really rare. Uh, yeah, and if you don't know the backstory, I kind of got thinking that this would be my retirement, uh, digging out some old cards and realized they were worth less now than I probably paid for them. Yeah. So I just decided, why am I saving on to these for years? And uh, I still have a bunch at home. I love to collect old, unopened packs. I just thought it was time for us to start opening some. So we start off with a known player. I don't know how it's not his rookie card, but Paul Molitor. So I my um my uncle was a big uh, Milwaukee Brewers fan. He had a ton of Paul Molitor stuff. Okay, another guaranteed common that you never wanted to see when you're opening a pack back in the day because you cared less about it. A checklist. Right, but checklists so, sometimes can be worth a lot now. Yeah, right? because people didn't keep them. Right, they didn't keep them, and you might if you're putting it up a set. Sometimes you could see what player you're missing today. Now you can look them up on the internet and right. find them. So they do come in handy. So this one is, uh, help me with this one. It's a rookie cards. It is. It's a These Star Sluggers. These are two sluggers. rookies. Star Sluggers. Who we got there, John? Okay, let me see. I'm going to have to. Um, it's a Star Rookie checklist is what it is. So um, that's, um, golly, that is, I'll have to look at this real quick. It's Jim up. Tomey. Okay. Is the is the Indians guy. Okay. I know that. And it says Kleisko, Kleisko, um, which is for the Braves. So we probably well, have Jim bigger... Tomey definitely had a better career. Yes, again, probably. Ryan Klesko. Ryan, Ryan Klesko. Klesko. Okay. For the Braves. So Jim so Tomey had a, Jim had Tomey a pretty rookie good card. Career. Correct. So this this guy I really liked uh, back in the day. I actually have went to a card show and got his autograph. We have Mark Grace. Oh, Mark Grace. There you go. I think these are cool looking cards, and a lot of them are good action shots. Uh, Eric Davis. From, oh. We have a Reds fan in yeah, the building Cincinnati tonight. Yeah, Cincinnati Reds. There you go, Eric Davis. Do you remember Eric Davis? How long have you been a fan? Would be the question, I guess. Right. Uh, Gerald Clark. When I was a kid, um, until the Fleer Ultras came out, um, Upper Deck was what I always collected. Exactly. So this is Ger- Gerald Clark. That's the uh, San Diego Padres. Well, this guy I remember as a Ranger, but here he's wearing a Detroit. Isn't this a Ranger? Let me see. Pete Inclo- In Cavilia. In Cavilia. Yes, he was. He was a was Ranger a outfielder for card? a long time. No, oh, heavens no. Um, Pete In Cavilia played for the Shreveport Minor League team, Tim. Yeah. And so my uncle got his uh, signature at one point. So. All right. But he was a Ranger, yes. I do remember him as a Ranger. Mm-hmm. Uh, Franklin Stubbs. Franklin Stubbs for the Milwaukee Brewers. Can't say I remember him, but okay. Definitely, uh, this player was really good uh, for the Blue Jays. We have John Olerud. Oh, John Olerud. Yeah, Blue Jays. I also remember this guy being a pretty good hitter, but not great. But Shane Mack. Yep, Shane Mack. 
So Shane Mack is the Minnesota Twins. Back when they were Minnesota. All right. They so kind of so. we'll say that one. To lo- we'll Let's see. Oh, um, Mr. Dwayne C9 says, one of my favorite players as a kid. Yeah. The Cincinnati Reds. So that was, um, I have to go back through here. Um, All right. Let me see if I can find him. I'll save that card for the end and just say Eric that, Davis. Eric Davis. Yeah. I'll save that card for the end and say that this pack just paid for itself. Oh, good. We got so a good, good one. Yeah. Finally, finally got a, a pretty good hit. We need hit. something to flash on the screen that's like, winner, winner. This yeah, is like also, that. I think, a rookie card or a second year because he's playing with the Mariners. Um, some of you Yankees fans might remember, but although he's playing for the Mariners here, Tino Martinez. Yes, Tino Martinez. So let me see. Um, he, this was a second-year card. He was for the Mariners. He did end up at the Yankees, I think. Yeah. Eventually. Yeah. Just like and all had, good players do. Right. <laughs> um, Mike Pagliarulio, I think. Yes. Um, About as close. As, I remember that name. Me too. It's in Minnesota. He was a um, was he a pitcher? No, he's a hitter. Yeah. He's a third baseman. Uh, for the Orioles, Glenn Davis. Glenn Davis, there you go. All right. Carmelo Martinez. I don't remember him, but is that also a Red? That is also a Cincinnati Reds. Carmelo Martinez. You have to tell us if you remember him. I was going to say, the Eric Davis card, like you said, has really good action on it. I don't know if you guys can see it, if it's going to zoom in really good, but you can see that's a beautiful action shot that they got of him catching the ball. Now, this is going to be one of this is one of my favorite pools in a while. I love this card. I remember this card. Um, a famous uh, junior that played. Uh, his dad was also a good baseball player, but we do have... Looks like oh a the King Griffey year. Junior's shadow card oh my goodness yeah so Ken I Gr- remember this card this is a cool card yeah Ken Griffey Junior action card here and then of course he always wearing the hat backwards having a good time I like Ken Griffey Junior oh yeah I, uh, King Griffey Junior was the best pure hitter of of the period that I grew up in in that early like late eighties early nineties right like, now King it's not Jr. the it's not the eighty nine Ken Griffey Junior right which is the this is card the ninety two but I still like him nonetheless. Anytime you get a Ken Griffey Jr. card, it's a good day. Absolutely. So All 92 right. Ken Griffey Jr., great card. Tim. So last Congratulations. Pack, the last pack tonight is one I'm really most interested in. I saved it for last. It is a 1990 Fleer basketball. Of course, during that time, we, uh, we're looking for Jordan... Yeah. Or somebody like that. So uh, Mr. Sure. Dwayne said he doesn't remember. Um, he didn't remember the other. Well, if you don't guy, remember him, we're... Carmelo Martinez. If you don't remember him, we're not going to remember him. Yeah, I don't. I don't think Carmelo had a Hall of Fame career. <laughs> you never know. He may have. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. How bad player. is that? Right. I don't yeah, either. I say. Okay. So wow, no gum in this one either. Man, we're just all out of the gum tonight. So um, we're we're off to a good start, Jonathan. So first guy I do not know. Winston Garland. Winston Garland. Um, so he, let me see if it has the team on here. Um, Clippers, Los Angeles Clippers. Okay. Um, probably the best card. We'll save him to the end. Unless, if something beats that, I'll be surprised. That was okay. a rookie card. Okay. Uh, Terry Cartledge? Cartledge? Yeah. Catledge. Catledge. Terry Catledge. And he was an Orlando Magic. I was a big Orlando Magic fan back in the day, Tim. I remember this guy more in college, but Sam Bowie. Yeah, Sam Sam Bowie. He was um, New Jersey Nets, right? Yeah. Or Port. Actually, this is no, this is New Jersey Nets. New Jersey Nets. And we have Rex Chapman. He oh, Rex Chapman. There you go, Charlotte Hornets. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like a lot of these guys, I'm going to remember just from NBA Jam, Tim. Right. <laughs> you know? so, well, you know, if they made the jam, right, they're they, pretty good, right? If they made good, the jam, right? they must have they must have been doing something right. So, uh, Michael Rex in Michael there. Cage. Yep. Oh, Michael Cage, Seattle, Seattle SuperSonics. Yeah. Uh, Tony Campbell. Tony Campbell, Minnesota Timberwolves. Uh, Walter Davis. Walter Davis guard for the Denver Nuggets. Oh, Denver Nuggets card. Look at that. I don't remember this guy, but he's a spur. Frank Brikowski. Brikowski is very familiar. I think he was in uh, Jam too, Tim. So really? Frank he- Brikowski. I think he threw up a lot of bricks. Of course. Yeah. Um, he had a pretty long career with Seattle, and then um, it looks like uh, San Antonio and the Lakers for a little bit, Tim. All right. Uh, Jay Humphreys. Jay Humphreys for Milwaukee Bucks. Guard. I definitely remember that. Adrian Dantley. Okay. Adrian Dantley forward for the Dallas Mavericks. Yes. Uh, Antoine Carr. I remember him. Antoine Carr, Sacramento Kings forward. All right. Kevin Edwards. Kevin Edwards, Miami Heat guard. K. 
Okay, this would be worth more if it was a rookie card, but Craig Elo. Oh, yeah. Big guy. Elo. Cavs. It's a Cleveland Cavaliers. All right, and uh, not a bad card here, Kevin Duckworth. Oh, there you go. And he is Portland Trailblazers, a center. Duckworth. But I figure when I pulled this one and it was this rookie card that um, it probably is worth a little bit more than most of those. And that would be Mr. Tim Hardaway. As in Tim Hardaway Jr.'s dad? Yeah, <laughs> right. The senior, <laughs> so, Tim another, Hardaway. A lot of juniors tonight. What's senior up with Hardaway the, we had senior. A senior and a, we had a junior earlier. So there you go. Tim Hardaway, guard for Golden State Warriors at this point, Tim. So I would say probably our best card uh, was Ken Griffey tonight, followed by Hardaway. Maybe Bill Bates, just for personal collection. I don't think it has as much monetary value. but. Sure. Uh, always fun. You can put them back. I mean, that, yeah, I think was, you brought that zipline. Yeah, so, I'll put the, that's why I thought I'll just put them in there. Oh, I've got a long drive tonight. Yeah, so, so I'm going to wrap it up just real yeah. quick by um, talking about this uh, concert that I'm booking. Yeah. So um, it kind of came as a surprise to me, too. Didn't think I'd ever be a concert promoter, but here we are. I told Tim. Uh, I'm not going to give you guys the whole story. I'll just give you kind of the facts of it. Is that um, I've been a fan of an art, a music artist called, uh, his name is Ross King, for uh, since the pandemic. I discovered him during the pandemic. And, um, you know, we got to talking on social media and he said on his social media page, hey, if you ever want me to come play concert at your place, just reach out. Um, I reached out to him recently and it turned out he was playing a concert in Sulphur Springs, Tim, which is right. super close by. And so was he's like, I can make it. an hour away. Right, exactly. So he was like, I can make y'all's, um, I could do the concert in Sulphur Springs on the June 29th. And if you guys want to do a concert on the 30th, I'm right there. And so lo and behold, here we are. I have now booked a concert, a guy for to come play at our church. Um, his name's Ross King. And so if you've got Spotify or Apple Music, I'd encourage you just to go on and listen to his music. I love his music. Um, I've been introducing Tim to some of his music, uh, and I think Tim really likes his music as well. Um, a lot, it's Christian music, so I mean, if you're not into that, um, well, you may I would not say, to it, but. I would say that it's Christian music, but not like typical Christian yeah. music. It's more... It's not what you're going to hear on the radio. Right. It's not a radio or church music. Right. It's, it's, it's um, more... kind of poppy. Yeah, kind of singer songer songer uh, singer songwritery folk maybe. If you took like pop and hip hop, and you took mm. a singer songwriter style, like think um, think like Billy Joel, Elton John. You took like something like that. You took a lot of pop, and you kind of threw it all into a mixer. Um, you kind of get a little bit of Ross King. Mm. So um, he, he's very. But the the stuff he talks about is really tough stuff. He talks about going through tough times in your life, and that's one of the reasons I think I like him so much is because. You know, um, we can't always relate to, like, everything's good, and I'm good, and we're all happy, and everything's perfect. Um, I no. don't relate to that music. Right. Okay, <laughs> I like that music sometimes, I'll admit. I, and if it has a good tune to it, I'm probably going to listen. But I think the music that gets me most is the kind of stuff that says, you know what, I'm going through a tough time right now, I'm really struggling, and I really need help. Right. Because the reason is, is because, you know, that's real honest music. Yeah. And it seems like so often we fake, especially nowadays with social media, we fake the way we look to the outside world. And mm -hmm. we don't want people to know that underneath all this we're struggling, that we're having issues. That's what Ross sings he about. He sings a lot about anxiety right. and going through some depression and And going through things. tough times. And so if you can relate to that kind of message, then you may, Ross King may be the kind of artist for you. If you relate more to everything's always good and I'm always happy and, you know, <laughs> God's always good, which God is always good. But, you know, it, just because God's always good doesn't mean you're not always going to go through trouble. That's, That's what right. people remember. So um, Ross's song is about dealing with mental health issues. It's about dealing with um, personal when things aren't going your way, you know, uh, and how to deal even with that. talks about like politics, how we can be so wrapped up in politics that, you know, it, it's um, uh, one of his songs that I'm really liking is I'm not on anybody's side. Right, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm, he calls himself politically homeless. Maybe you can, maybe you can relate to that message. He yeah. calls himself politically homeless. It's like I'm not on the right, I'm not on the left. I don't know where I am. Right. You know, and and so a lot of his songs are just singing about where am I? You mm -hmm. know, and so, you know, part of that is that. So maybe you feel like that, too. You feel like you're politically homeless. I don't yeah. feel like I belong on the right. I don't feel like I belong on the left. You know, his songs have a lot to do with that. So, so you can go to YouTube and Google or, or Google Ross King. Yep. And you'll find some of his music. Just try it out. I think if um, if you're just kind of one of those people, you're, you're not into all the cheery, everybody's great, you're great, I'm fine, everybody's fine. You want some real honest music. I think that comes through some of the stuff he's went through. Um, I think you guys would like it some. So, And I sent Tim a post on Reddit um, that I found about him. It was in an ex-Christian group. 
Did you see that? Yes. So um, somebody in an ex-Christian group said, man, I can't stand Christian music anymore. Except for that guy, Ross King. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason why is because Ross is real. He yeah. talks about real stuff. And so, like I said, if you're going through a tough time in your life, especially right now, and maybe maybe you were once, maybe maybe you believed in God at one time, maybe you don't believe in him anymore. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but, you know, if you're going through a tough time regardless, that's what Ross's music is for. Mm-hmm. It's for the people who are going through tough times. And so if that's you, check him out on YouTube. Or if you've got Spotify, Apple Music, or whatever, I'd, I'd encourage you to listen. Because, man, um, his music will hit you hard. And even even in stuff that you may be solid on. Maybe you think to yourself, you know, um, I really have my mind made up about something. Ross will make you rethink that. Mm-hmm. His music will literally say, he'll flip that upside down and say, you know, maybe you need to rethink what you're thinking. And so, right. you know, I love music like that because it's challenging. And it's not for everybody. I'll agree. But I do think it's the right message. And Tim actually said this. He's like, it's the right message for the right time. I think so. I think it's a it's a timely message. It's it's a shift, a paradigm shift almost that I see. And that you know, um, face it, not everybody has. It's a tough time for a lot of people financially right now. It's a tough time to be married. Mm-hmm. It's a tough time to be raising kids. It's a tough time even just be collecting games. And trying to get parts mm-hmm. and stuff. There, uh, the struggle is real for a lot of people. So I don't ever want anybody to feel like you're alone either. We we, we mention this from time to time. Uh, we like games. Uh, we love working on games. But we love helping people most of all. So uh, we want you to feel like we're your friends. And we feel like you're our friends. And so if you're going through a tough time, you some, maybe you just need somebody to reach out to or whatever. Uh, know that we're here for you. And know that we care. And we appreciate when you guys listen and some of you that stick through all this after show and everything. Uh, some of you are working right now and uh, maybe you're just on a break or maybe you just ran across us by chance. There is no chance. There's a reason you're here uh, because you make the show special and just you being here. Maybe you need to hear that tonight that just somebody out there cares about your struggles, about what you're going through. And that's us. We do care. And so thank you for tuning in. We hope that you enjoyed the show. Hope yeah. that it's entertained and enlightened you. And I'll, I will say just one more thing. Um, pop music has gotten more honest, too. And Ross, if you see him interviewed, will talk about this. If you listen to pop music now, yeah. pop music's a lot about honesty. I mean, like, um, have you heard M. Byhold, her song Numb Little Bug? That's about going her personal struggles with, with kind of depression. Yeah. And so there's a lot of For new real. artists here, um, even in the pop genre, that are being more honest. And guys, that's really what we need right now. We need people mm. being honest. You need to be honest with your feelings. If you're down... That's okay. You don't have to be happy all the time. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing we need to recognize. But here's the thing: you need to recognize that you're down too. Right. And say, you know, you know, I'm down, and I maybe I need somebody to talk to, or maybe and I need to reach out to somebody. One of the bis- you know? biggest mistakes you can ever make is not reaching out to right. not say something, uh, or you know. And you think you're going through whatever you're going through alone? You're no, not. No. There's tons of people going through the same stuff you're going through. Yeah. Especially mental health right now. Yeah. Coming out of the pandemic, guys, we're still all struggling with. I'm struggling with it. Okay, we're all struggling with that. It was such an upside down. It turned all of our worlds upside down. And so, when you're talking about mental health and stuff like that, guys, I wonder why we're not all screwed up from being Mm -hmm. inside and isolated for so long. And so, when you listen to Ross's music, you listen to honest pop music, you can connect with that. You know, that's my thing. And we can connect with you too. And you know, I promise you though, whatever you're going through, you're not the only one going through it. Right. Okay. We're all all of us have our struggles. We're all going through something. So, uh, and I think we'll leave it there, Tim. Right. So, um, but we would encourage you to check out Ross King's music if you, and uh, let us know what you think of it. Um, he is coming to our church on June thirtieth. If you're uh, close by and you want to come, the concert is free. So I would love for you guys to come as well. Um, you can find the event on um, on uh, the our church's website online. If you look up Ross King concert, I think it'll come up. If you go on Facebook or something. So, but uh, at least you know check it out and see what you think if you're interested in that. But we're out. Um, our next show will be June or July sixth. Six right after the holiday. So right. Every- so we hope you have a wonderful Fourth of July. We hope you get to hang out with your families and friends and eat hot dogs, hamburgers, see some fireworks <laughs> and all that good stuff. We'll be back after that. Okay, after we celebrate our independence here. United States and we look forward to seeing you then so come back join us on on July 6th at 5 30 p.m. central time for another live show take care everybody good night we'll see you soon thank you safe trip Tim thank you <laughs>